Hello everyone and welcome back to Do We Know Them? I'm Lily Marston here with Jesse Smiles and we made it to episode 170. Yep, here mm -hmm. we are. <laughs> you sound thrilled. Oh no, I just don't have anything to say about the number or really anything to lead with. Well, I did go viral. Oh, that's right, you did. I have never been more confused in my life. Like at least for example, when um, like the Kate Middleton thing went viral, that made sense. Right. I, like I got it, I was offering something. This, I was like, excuse me? You guys, I tweeted out because people, and it wasn't even just people talking to me, although I did get a few of those too, but I kept seeing the word demure everywhere. <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck? Why does everyone keep using that? Like, that's such a random word. And then I found out, obviously. But then after I tweeted that, kind of forgot I did. And then I saw Jocelyn post something and she referenced it. And I went to go screenshot my tweet to send it to her and be like, oh my God, I'm so stupid. Why am I the only person that didn't know what this was? And I go to screenshot and I have 115,000 likes, which then this morning was 152,000 likes. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? It's been viewed 10 million times. And it's just me saying like, Psst, can someone please tell me why <laughs> everyone is saying demure all of a sudden? And um, all the comments were just like, oh, that's so demure of her to ask. Did anybody actually and explain it to you? Oh, okay. Yeah, no, then people sent me the TikTok and I got it. You see how I do my makeup for work? very demure very mindful i don't come to work with a green cut crease i don't look like a clown when i go to work i don't do too much i'm very mindful while i'm at work i'm very modest i'm very mindful yeah i think hands down my most viral tweet ever is it more than one trump retweeted you yeah oh mm -hmm. I don't know. But a few people did bring that up. They're like, the real ones remember when they got retweeted by Trump without even mentioning him. And I'm like, I... That was a weird time. Yeah, definitely was. Um, well, congratulations. Let me know if your life changes in any way. You know, <laughs> I will say, because the Trump one, a lot of uh, not so nice responses. But um, this has been like 90% positive, I would yeah, say. Yeah, I mean, what are they gonna, Really? What is a 10%? What the fuck can they even say? Just, the, and not even it directed at me, just like in general, that like TikTok is stupid and- Oh, uh, got you. People saying it's annoying. But um, yeah, no, very confusing. And I, I guess also has got, like I've gotten sent it's on a meme page on Facebook too. I'm like, has no one else asked what it meant? I don't know what kind of crowd you're attracting with Twitter and Facebook. I don't like that. Apparently 10 million people. Yeah, but like, I mean, the folks that are liking it, I'm like, mm, I don't know if we want them to find out about this podcast is all I got to say. Right, right. But yeah, so uh, otherwise I've been balls deep looking into the It Ends With Us drama, which is very reminiscent of one of our <laughs> like early topics, which um, I feel like was a fan favorite, the Don't Worry Darling song. You know, every time I think of that episode, I just remember it being... You were falling asleep. I was falling asleep <laughs> because it was so long. And I remember when we filmed it, we had to like cut it in two. Like we filmed for like two hours, then we cut it and then we filmed for like another hour. And I honestly wanted to die. <laughs> it's funny because when I think back to that time for that episode, I think I was too like engrossed in like reading everything right, and going yeah. over it to get drunk. But that was when I would drink like two full tall boys for sure. in episode yeah. and be yeah, like yeah, yeah. wasted. And I'm like, I don't Oh, that's understand. another thing. I think I drank wine or so I, I'm pretty sure it was wine, which is why I got so sleepy because it just was over the course of so long. And then I was just like, oh my God. <laughs> it ended up being people's like one of their favorite episodes I know, but you the know? best was the salad dressing um right because the, then you made it a couple episodes later and it was it was so basic like it was a journey. basic ass vinaigrette i don't even understand why that happened but okay yeah that was my favorite part is like well it's what we suspected Olivia Wilde's weird as hell. Jason too. I mean, clearly Jason's weird with this obsession with the salad dressing. If this is true. <laughs> Guys, we have exciting news. <laughs> This is the breaking news update. This is totally worth us getting ready again, filming again, because we just had to come on here and tell you guys what we found out. And it's, of course, what I already knew. Tell them, Lily. It's a vinaigrette. It's a vinaigrette. <laughs> it's a vinaigrette. <laughs> As if that was like the big bombshell of the entire story. This one, though, seems honestly, and not to shit on Don't Worry Darling, but this one seems a little bit more interesting, if you will. When you work with someone that closely, I'm sure all the time people fight. <laughs> like behind movies and directors and actors and shit. I'm sure it gets It's crazy. rare that you love all your coworkers. Exactly. So I'm not surprised that there's like drama. It's just interesting. People are saying we have a new J-Lo amidst and I'm excited about that. Okay, well, that's the thing. So if you are like, what the fuck are you talking about? Sorry, Which I feel yeah. like is probably not the case because I feel like everyone has at least seen something about this. Trigger warning before we get started. We are not going into detail by any means, but the entire plot of the movie is very much rooted in domestic violence themes. So if that is triggering, 
might not be the episode for you. But it's about the movie It Ends With Us, which is starring Blake Lively. And it is also starring Justin Baldoni from Jane the Virgin and his podcast. He's not only one of the main characters, but he's also the director. The whole thing is also based off a Colleen Hoover book. Yeah. What do you know about Colleen Hoover? Because I don't read. Okay, I know she's a popular artist. I mean, not artist. She's not an artist. She's an author. Yeah, period. <laughs> I was like, oh, I, I guess authors no, could no. be artists. She's but. like a popular author that from everything I've gathered from my friends that love to read and shit, they don't like her. It's like she has a lot of fans, obviously, who like her books. But for some reason, a lot of people who are avid readers do not like Colleen Hoover. And I don't know why. That's the thing. I, I feel like she's very polarizing, but also people love her books. The people that do But love also it, yeah. some people hate them, too. But like people just don't like her as a person, too, I guess, is what I've gathered. So the book in question, I guess we should do a spoiler alert. I don't feel like it's like a secret what the general plot is. But spoiler alert, if you don't want to be spoiled, I would. Uh, I don't you're not gonna be able to listen to this episode so I think maybe just deal with it basically the book is called it ends with book and movie is called it ends with us and that is because Blake Lively's character has this relationship her name is Lily by the way I know Lily Bloom and she has a flower shop I'm like Lily Bloom owns a, fl- a flower shop yeah maybe right. the names <laughs> in it are a bit much <laughs> she um meets this guy Ryle which is a name Ryle <laughs> spell it Kyle but with an r no, no offense to any Riles watching. Are there any Riles? I don't know. Like, oh, I don't, God, is you that know they got bullied in school. It's like, don't rile him up. It's like, oh, <laughs> God, please. Ryle does get riled up because the entire plot line here is that she meets him. They fall in love. Everything's great. And then all of a sudden stuff starts to not be so great because he is a abuse- I don't know all the specifics there. We're not going to go into detail. Basically, she gets pregnant with his child. And then once she has the baby, she has this kind of like come to Jesus moment where she's like, I need to end this cycle of abuse because I guess her parents also had an abusive relationship. So that's where it ends with us because she says that to the baby at the end of the book. And then it like plays into a sequel. It's like Waitress the musical. Kind of. I didn't know anything about that movie slash musical. Slash she was in a really movie. horrible relationship. And then she when she had the baby, it was like this awakening moment. And she told him to go fuck himself. Well, there, yeah. So I guess that's pretty much it. And I guess the book did get criticized a bit for like glamorizing abuse, supposedly. I don't know. I've heard kind of mixed things. And I obviously haven't read it. So I'm not really going to speak on that. Because it deals with domestic violence, that is the big point of contention here. I hadn't seen a trailer or anything, but even based on the few things that I had seen with Blake Lively promoting this movie, definitely picked up that it was like a romantic comedy or like just like a romantic movie that's like not about domestic violence. I don't think it's entirely uncommon to like not know what the fuck a movie's about by reading the trailer, but this does kind of take the cake. It's like, what? girl, gra- Girls grab your florals? Like, huh? Okay, so that's <laughs> the thing. And I guess it is still a romance, but there's just like darker themes yeah. woven in. The drama here, though, all centers around a supposed feud, which seems like it definitely, there's something there. We just don't exactly know for sure why, but it's a rift between Blake Lively and Justin Baldoni. Fans have noticed it because they like weren't it was similar to don't worry darling where they weren't taking pictures together at the premiere and they weren't doing any press together which is weird not just because they were both in the movie but because he's the director of the movie and usually the director that's a very conscious choice if you're co-stars and he's a director and you're not sitting together in interviews you requested that to happen like there's no like chance that they just wouldn't be in interviews together and not just not with her but He's not with any of the cast and she is with all the cast. Oh, right. So is that why people originally thought he was the issue? Because I remember that being a thing. So yeah, the initial like vibe was, oh, and it's also because most of the cast does not follow him on Instagram, which seems stupid. But like, what's crazy there is I've said this before. I'm like, why would you like just ignore it? Like just mute them or something. Right. Like it feels like unfollowing is such a conscious thing to make a statement, which seems weird when you're promoting a movie unless it was like as a marketing tactic I guess I mean and it has gotten people to talk about it more but I don't know Uh, I guess he is following them and they are not following him okay and that includes Colleen Hoover Blake Lively Jenny Slate who's in it supposedly there's a rift between him and the whole cast but now that we get down to it it doesn't really seem like anyone else has ever like I haven't seen any yeah I haven't even seen like claims from like inside sources and stuff that specify anything other than like oh yeah they didn't get along what's kind of crazy too about everyone thinking it's Justin Baldwin that's the issue i get why because of the whole following on instagram thing but have you ever seen an interview with justin baldoni or like seen him on his podcast he seems 
kind of like an angel. Like, I mean, that could be a front he's putting up. Let me acknowledge that. But that would be a hell of a front. No, but like, do we know them? Uh, no, but he does follow me on Instagram. <gasps> really? Yeah, I don't really know why. Do you think he did it intentionally? He no offense to you. I'm just like, did his finger slip? Like, why is he, <laughs> <laughs> he bothered? Isn't he like married? Like, is he just following gr young girls? No, I don't know. Um... I mean, I don't think you're not worth following. I'm just confused. Maybe he watched the podcast. I want to know more. Why is he following you? No, uh, it's been for a while. I think I commented on something once and uh, I feel like just because I'm verified, maybe he was like, who is uh, that? Yeah, and maybe that's it. I okay. think I have a couple like not mutual friends, but like people that have met him that he follows. So he probably was like, oh, she follows similar people. I don't for know. sure. For sure. Yeah. For okay. whatever reason. That makes sense. And I follow him back. But um, yeah, duh. <laughs> like he very much seems like a walking green flag. Flag. Yeah. Like he's like dedicated his career since Jane the Virgin to like dismantling the patriarchy. Yeah, <laughs> talking, talking about against like, toxic, toxic masculinity. Exactly. Men, I understand. <laughs> Growing up, we tend to challenge each other. We got to be the toughest, the strongest, the bravest men that we can be. And for many of us, myself included, our identities are wrapped up in whether or not at the end of the day we feel like we're man enough. But I got a challenge for all the guys, because men love challenges. <laughs> I challenge you to see if you can use the same qualities that you feel make you a man to go deeper into yourself. Your strength, your bravery, your toughness. Can we redefine what those mean and use them to explore our hearts? Are you brave enough to be vulnerable? to reach out to another man when you need help, to dive headfirst into your shame? Are you strong enough to be sensitive, to cry whether you are hurting or you're happy, even if it makes you look weak? Are you confident enough to listen to the women in your life, to hear their ideas and their solutions, to hold their anguish and actually believe them, even if what they're saying is against you? And will you be man enough to stand up to other men when you hear locker room talk? When you hear stories of sexual harassment, when you hear your boys talking about grabbing ass or getting her drunk, will you actually stand up and do something so that one day we don't have to live in a world where a woman has to risk everything and come forward to say the words, me too? So it was shocking to hear like he made people uncomfortable on set or people right. don't like him. I was like, but he seems so nice. Which could be a front again, you know? Exactly. It would be shocking, but it wouldn't be the yeah. first time. And it's interesting because no one has said anything, but the cast, they get asked about him and they actively choose not to address his name or like really they just like kind of skirt around the answers oh it's mostly just Blake Lively and then there's one with Jenny Slate that's super <laughs> awkward <laughs> basically just no one's like oh the Justin did a great job directing no one is giving him any praise damn and he is giving everyone praise and specifically Blake Lively you know I remember meeting Blake for the first time and she was so disarming and she felt so approachable she's not just an actor She's so much more than that. She's a creative powerhouse. She's a producer, she's a writer, um, she's, a, she's a fashion designer. She touched so many aspects of this production and everything she touched, she made better. She's just a walking, uh, uh, you know, creative. I don't know if you know how smart and creative she really is. I think she's best known as an actress and, a, and of course she's, you know, a fashion, you know, icon, but she is so much more than that. She is a dynamic creative. She had her hands in every part of this production and everything she touched, she made better. I had a three hour meeting with Blake the first time we ever met. And shortly after that meeting, I texted her and I just said, you are, you are Lily Bloom. I don't think people realize how involved she was in this movie. Um, I mean, she's a producer on the film from the beginning to the end. She was extremely involved and she really made the film better. And there were many instances where I honestly just tried to get out of the way and let her take the lead. It's like uh, the difference between driving, you know, maybe like a Toyota Camry, no offense to Toyota Camrys, or like a Ferrari. You're like acting with somebody who's like a Ferrari of an actor and you move a little bit and then they respond. And it really was, uh, was incredible just in terms of helping me craft the performance. Oh, she's a, she's a creative force. She's a genius. Every, she was involved in every aspect of this production and everything she touched, she made better.
Which is another reason why I'm like, hmm, why this makes me feel so weird because he's being so nice, but it's like, is he being so nice because he is trying to damage control? Yeah. We'll get to a few reasons why people think there's a feud, but most of the fan fueled stuff is because of the marketing of this movie. So even just the articles that have been put out about it, it describes it. It ends with us, stars lively as Lily Bloom, a woman who overcomes a traumatic childhood to embark on a new life. And then it says that she like begins to see some sides of Ryle that remind her of her parents' relationship. That is the only allusion to any domestic violence in like the synopsis that these outlets are putting out. Meanwhile, if you look up the book, very much front and center, it's like things take a turn when Ryle becomes abusive. Then it talks about the title being the end of the movie, how she is stopping the cycle of abuse with her. Hi, girlies. Just want to clarify really fast that what I was just reading from was a book review. So that wasn't necessarily like how the book was being marketed, but that was how it was being interpreted. And like people that read it, this was how they would describe it. Notably, though, apparently the book, very similar to how we're seeing the movie being marketed, does not focus on DV very much, which ties into what we mentioned earlier about a lot of people said that this book actually glamorizes uh, DV and is also why people have a problem with Colleen Hoover because because a lot of people feel that she doesn't take topics like DV seriously. And apparently that goes beyond just the story itself. Uh, specifically, people had a big problem because for this book, she felt it was appropriate to launch a nail polish collab, as well as try to launch a coloring book, which was met with quite a bit of backlash and didn't end up happening. And instead, Colleen actually ended up issuing an apology, which was an Instagram story where she just had text on screen. It said the coloring book was developed with Lily's strength in mind, but I can absolutely see how this was tone deaf. I hear you guys and I agree with you. No excuses, no finger pointing. I've contacted the publisher to let them know I would prefer we don't move forward with it. Thank you for the respectful discourse and accountability, nothing but love. So I guess we shouldn't really be surprised because it is very much how Colleen has marketed her stuff in the past. Um, definitely tracks with that. But anyway, thought that was some important context and yeah. Okay, back to us. It might just come down to, in order to market the movie, they wanted to play down the abuse because they're like, well, more people will come and see it probably. Because it's not a horror movie where you have to show like, okay, this is a scary thing. You're going to feel a certain type of way when you're watching this. Abuse, but like mixed in with a rom-com, which I agree is kind of weird, is m kind of maybe a harder thing to sell. And I think that that's For sure. the fucked up thing that. overall where it's like, they are just trying to sell like a story about that's, that is what's happening. That's what it comes down to. Because I get not wanting to be like, yeah, it's domestic violence and like making it just like so front and center. But it's not just Blake, although she is getting most of the shit about how she is personally answering questions and choosing to talk about the movie. Specifically, the marketing for the movie, it literally like they had like an Instagram thing. It's one of their taglines for this movie <laughs> is grab your girls and wear your florals. Hello, Blake Lively here. Colleen Hoover. And It Ends With Us is in theaters now. So grab your friends, wear your florals, and head out to see it. What the fuck does that even like, mean? Because she has a flower shop and she wears florals. They definitely typed into chat GPT. What do women like? <laughs> no, literally. And so I thought that, because there's a, basically that was one of the things that first got people kind of like, mm, because Blake is saying that in like a promo for it. And also like besides it being gross that like they're trying to kind of allegedly hide what this is about so that more people will watch and they'll make more money. It's flat out irresponsible. Like do you know how triggering that is for someone who doesn't know the story and has been through DV themselves and then sits down in that theater and is like holy shit what the fuck I thought this was a rom-com. Exactly exactly and that's like I get that it's not the entire story but like literally that's what the title is about. Like the whole thing is about how she is escaping generational. You don't have to be a the whole movie for it to be a movie I, about a, like it doesn't have to be I every agree. second that's not how life is that's the main theme that everything is centered around yeah so yeah there are other aspects of the movie obviously because it's not just going to be 100 percent abuse all the time but when they really started pushing the promo right before the release grab your friends and wear your florals was like one of their go-to taglines which just feels insane. As if that didn't kind of already irk people, then if you compare how Justin Baldoni has talked about this movie in every interview he does, it is very much in the same vibe of like his podcast and like how he's a man so he couldn't possibly understand but he wanted to do this story justice and he thinks that it like represents hope for people and hopefully will inspire them to like break the cycle of abuse. And meanwhile, Blake Lively seems kind of like she missed the whole point of the movie. 
or is just like purposely ignoring it so she can promote it so it does the best box office numbers. It's also notable that her husband, obviously Ryan Reynolds, he just came out with Deadpool Wolverine. So the two of them have very much piggybacked on each other's press ops and like been trying to push both of them. And I guess they have literally like broken records. They're like the first married couple to have this big of a box office weekend since like Demi Moore and Bruce Willis. And this movie actually has surpassed the initial like estimate for how well it was going to do. It's like surpassed it by like millions. It made 50 million in its first weekend. But notably Ryan Reynolds has much better press in this situation than she does. Like everything that I've seen show up on my For You page, whether it was him doing the like chicken shop date thing with that girl who's really funny, Uh the blonde girl. He has had much better press and like funny clips and stuff come out. Everything I've seen of Blake has number one been against my will, but number two has been really hard to watch. Well, one of the things that I found really hard to watch though is it's not like she's getting the better press ops by any means, obviously, and it's Deadpool and it's a comedy. So it's like, that makes sense why he would be doing funny things. But um, like she must have recruited him to do a promo that then also Hugh Jackman is in and his mom. Have you seen it? Hugh Jackman's mom? No, no. Ryan Reynolds' mom. <laughs> oh, and then I was Hugh like, Jackman. that's so random. Uh, no, I have not. Because apparently Hugh, uh, Hugh Jackman and him are like best friends in real life, but then also he's Wolverine. Notably, Blake is not in this. And also Justin is not in this. It's the other co-star. So like the childhood love interest that comes back. That's yeah. like He's in the movie, but he's not like the main like love interest. And this was one of the first things I actually saw. You would think based on this, it is a romantic comedy, like hands down. But it also just is so weird. Thank you, Brandon. I love the movie. Appreciate it. Thanks, man. <clears throat> Jail. Oh, God. This is um, cool. <laughs> it's not every day the husband gets to interview his wife's love interest in a film. It's kind of crazy. I don't know? remember uh, hey, seeing hey, this on the schedule. Let's dive in, shall we? So I saw you posing in a photo with Mrs. Reynolds, and um, I'm sorry, what do you call her? Do you guys have a nickname or no. something? Okay, no, just so it's Mrs. Okay. Um, anyway, I saw this photo. It was pretty suggestive. So uh, I'm gonna, I got it right here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get right to it. Uh, how do you explain that? The genetics? Crickets. It's some sort of like low angle squat routine to pop that region in that way. I mean, what's going on here, man? Are you smuggling pumpkins? Got a couple of small pumpkins there? Jesus Christ, my heart is beating like crazy right now. It reminds me of when I went on that meth journey, confront my inner child, and I, I just- on a meth journey. I think you mean like ayahuasca, like you, South American plant known for its medicinal benefits. Definitely not meth. What? You should not be doing a meth journey. I don't know. I've been on a meth journey for about six months now. I mean, I'm not a doctor, but you're probably gonna die. I feel well. You don't look well. Let's talk motorcycles here. Do you ride? Uh, yeah, a little bit. What kind of bike do you like to ride? I mean, anything with two wheels and kickstand, right? Honestly, that could be anything. I mean, as far as I know, you <laughs> just described, you know, riding Stephen Hawking uh, through the Nevada Stephen desert Hawking's in the middle dead, of the summer heat the wave. Yeah. He's not gonna make it. Ryan? Ryan? Yep. You wanna take a break? From Blake? Sure. What? It's so weird. Like, you're not Zach Galifianakis in between two ferns. Like, this is, I don't know what this is. Hello, Brandon. No. Well, it's not every day the mother-in-law of the leading lady gets to interview the love interest and the man trying to replace my sweet little gummy bear, Ryan. Let's dive in, shall we? Should we not dive in? Mom, it's Ryan. I wrote all these questions, but don't tell Brandon. I didn't expect to love him so much, so don't fucking blow this for me. Oh my God, that language. Seriously, uh, can we just, we don't have to do this. I mean, I'm not crazy about interviews. Brandon, I saw the film, and may I say, you are incredible in this movie. On a scale from one to, I stopped taking my blood thinner medication, because if I can't have you, I don't want me. Mrs. Reynolds, you should probably keep taking your medication. And I'm a little worried about your son. Like, he's for sure addicted to meth, right? God damn, you're gorgeous. It creeps up on you. Jesus, What's God, happening? No. Did you know that Ryan lost so his father in 2015? I'm sorry. Man, living with Ryan must have been incredibly hard for him. Bro, I don't feel very comfortable asking this question. Nope, oh, I got it. I'll get it. Here, I can do that. Here, you're not going to read it. I will then. Okay, thank you very much. That's, yeah, that's the one. Um, it says, Ryan would love to have a new dad to have a catch. And I think he could really use a man in his life. Hugh is no spring chicken anymore. Uh, Blink once for yes, or blink once for I'd love to be your new dad. 
He blinked. He, 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 he blinked. Is this hell? No, it's Iowa. <laughs> That's from Field of Dreams. It's one of Ryan's favorite movies because he oh God, and his late I'm, father just, had so much so unresolved weird. sadness. Understand. But pride got in the way and neither of them were able to find closure. Um, How long did he go on for? She just doesn't stop is a talking. True story I, because he's on meth. What is the meth thing? Is super what is any scary. of this? I'm so confused on what like, I'm even watching. Oh, uh, what I is could this? I blow your fucking mind, dog. <laughs> oh, man. Brandon. Tammy, you're crazy. No. Why is he it's not every day a guy here? gets to interview the love interest of his best friend's wife and the guy trying to replace Ryan as a husband and me is his best mate. Holy shit. I've never done an interview before, but I've done a lot of things, like crazy things in Australia. You do understand you can't even get into preschool unless you take a person's life with your own bare hands. Twice. Totally. So listen, I've just got one question. What the hell are you doing messing with my best buddy's wife? Sir, I have no idea what's happening at all today. But I do have to say, while I have you here, your work in Les Mis, Oh my god, this what? is just making me uncomfortable. I mean, I am. In? I, 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 I'm just. That's it. But then they ultimately all, um, his mom, Hugh, and Ryan all end up in the same outfit as the guy Brandon. Okay. I so first of all, I don't find that funny. Regardless, I think it is the weirdest. Like, right, like I, take everything out of it that people are upset about, and it's just like as a standalone piece, not funny. Don't get it. What are the meth jokes? Why? Like, you know what it is? I think that he got like, you know how often Ryan Reynolds goes viral on Twitter for his little witty one liners. And then Blake Lively also has joined in and become viral for just like making fun and doing this like dry humor thing. I think maybe he got too hyped up on the Internet. Before we go any further, we have a word from our sponsor, ZocDoc. If you guys listen to this podcast regularly, you already know ZocDoc because they are a regular sponsor and we love them very much. If you don't know... I guess I'll tell you. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare high quality in-network doctors, choose the right one for your needs and click instantly to book an appointment. And they do mean instantly. You can do it online, you don't have to call and they're usually available within 24 to 72 hours if you have any emergencies like I have had before. And my favorite part is how you can filter everything if you don't know what specialty doctor you need and you just know the condition you have or anything like that. It helps sort everything out and they also help you sort through insurance which is a big fuss when you're calling into a doctor's office that way, the person you're booking for sure will take your insurance and there's not going to be a problem with that. And they have over 100,000 healthcare providers to choose from. That ranges from mental health to dental health um, to eye care, skin care, basically everything. And they have reviews from verified patients. So if you want to stop putting off your doctor's appointments, you can head over to ZocDoc.com slash DWKT to find and instantly book a top rated doctor today. That's ZocDoc.com slash DWKT. Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash D-W-K-T. And thank you so much to ZocDoc for being an amazing sponsor of this podcast. I guess he has this whole like title as a marketing guru now. It just seems like this I watched. I was like, okay, we get it. You're married. Like, why are you guys here? Not only did you not even remotely talk about the movie, but also this is just so weird. And I mean, I don't even think they say the name of the movie. He just says it in the caption and there's the poster behind them, but they don't even say anything about, I mean, it's just, I don't know how long that was, but it was minutes of my life I can never get back. Like that was the dumbest shit yeah. I've ever watched. And it very much, it's uh, like you said, it does not even reference the movie. It no. is entirely trying to get people to go see it based on Ryan and Blake. This comment pretty much says it all. This is the weirdest promo for a movie about domestic violence. Like, why are you here, Ryan? Literally. <laughs> Literally you? here. So I, I took a screenshot of a few. A lot of them are like, this is whack. Your wife was miscast and you and her promoting yourself on a DV movie is terrible. Awful making jokes about a movie that talks about domestic violence. Use your platform better if you're going to make money with that. Basically, people were not happy. And that was just on his. The people commenting on Blake's upload of it are much more angry. Oh, she uploaded. Because he has thing? obviously. Yeah. Oh, brother. That is dumb. They really thought they ate Her caption them. is like, I was asleep. What did I miss? Jesus. Like, okay. Well, I don't know. I just get such weird vibes from how much they're leaning into this. Like, she even is talking in interviews about like how, well, we're married, but like, we're not just rooting for each other. Like, I work on everything he does. He works on everything I do. And I'm like, did everyone want that though? Ryan's here tonight. What is it like for the both of you to be promoting major motion pic pictures at the same time? Oh my gosh, it's just so thrilling in our house right now. I'm just, we're so 
We, you know, we help each other. We work together so much. So the, the iconic rooftop scene in this movie, my husband actually wrote it. Nobody knows that, but you know. Um, but he wrote it. He, he works on everything I do. I work on everything he does. So his wins, his celebrations are mine, and, and mine are his. I mean, he's all over this film. And Hugh Jackman. Um, Hugh Jackman is not all over this film, but he's all over this premiere, and I'm grateful for it. Surprise, my husband's coming to work and doing things today. Like, yeah. And I get that obviously no one's turning that down because it's obviously working and people love Deadpool that's like breaking box office records. People love Ryan Reynolds. So it makes sense why studios and like people would want to do that with any kind of financial interest in this movie. They'd be like, yeah, let Ryan do everything because they know he's going to get views and stuff. But like, it just feels so weird, especially given, I mean, it feels weird in general, but then especially given the theme of the movie. Meanwhile, Everything Justin has done, and including like his Instagram bio even, is all about like resources for domestic violence and like talking about how he wants to do this story justice, how he wants it to bring hope to people in the theater that they can break out of bad situations that they're in. And then hers, it's just like, oh my God, did you see my husband's in Deadpool? <laughs> Grab your florals. Yeah. So that's the vibe. And she has since maybe shifted a little. We're going to go through some of her interviews and react in a minute because that's what's been taking over TikTok. Before that even some of the issues that people have said are the origin of the rift between them uh justin and blake that is first of all the editing which this checks out when you think of that fucking promo we just watched apparently blake lively commissioned a cut of the movie by the Deadpool editor. His name is Shane Reed. And she um, supposedly, I read in one article, didn't tell uh, Justin this. She just like went and did it on her own. It basically went behind his back. and was like, I have a better version. I could totally see that happening. And honestly, that's kind of crazy because God, it just reminds me how rich they are. You can't just like commission a movie like out of nowhere if you're not fucking filthy rich that is so insane like uh, hey can you edit this just like so i can sh show just in case and i'm sure she presented it probably to justin like here i did this like you don't have to use anything but like even just the fact that she did commission someone to do an entire different cut is probably super offensive i don't know the standards in this business but like Sounds like it would be offensive to me. Well, yeah, because then also not only did he um, direct it, but his production company produced it. So like he had his own editors. He, it's like if you look at the credits, it's mostly like his production people, obviously. But then it also does notably have this other guy, Shane Reed, credited as an additional editor. So no one knows how much that cut ended up being used in the final project. But the fact that it was done to begin with, Blake is also a producer on the movie. But like Justin is an executive producer. His studio is making it. He is the director. And right. it seems like she was like, mm, no, I have a better idea. Yeah. And then also a, one of the articles about the rift is like that he was very offended because apparently Colleen Hoover and Blake approached him and insisted on there being some rewrites. And he like took it very personally. And I'm like, given all the other situations, if you also then have re-edited the movie for him too, like I would take it pretty personally as well. <laughs> I hate media for stuff like this because you have no idea what is actually legit or not in terms of claims because it's not like Blake and Justin are going and telling Hollywood Reporter or Deadline or Daily Mail all this stuff. It's always an inside source. It's like, okay, well, inside source for who? And also, like, how do... We, I don't know. Basically, we don't, we don't know if any yeah. of the rest of this is true. It's all alleged. Don't sue us. Supposedly, and this also checks out, given those other examples, that she maybe uh, did a little overstepping and chose to do some of the directing herself. And when you listen to Justin talk about the whole thing, and again, in line with this podcast and like really championing women in general, he very much acknowledges it is a story about women and he doesn't want to overstep. He wants it to be from the female gaze. He wants input from women. He hired a woman to be the intimacy coordinator, also to be the stunt director. Very much was consulting women on this entire project, according to him. Could that be a lie? Possibly. An easily but disprovable lie. Like, I feel like... I mean, at the very... Like, it's not a lie that he hired women. So, like, yeah. I guess he could have hired the women and then ignored everything they had to say, but it doesn't really seem like uh, that. Oh, I see. Yeah. But one of the articles that has come out more recently is... TMZ claiming that the reason for their rift is because Blake felt that he fat shamed her and also that he lingered too long on a kiss. 
And I was what like, what the fuck? I mean, I, I know that you can obviously have those boundaries. She's a married woman and all that stuff. But like, I feel like as an actor, like how long did he linger for you to feel that way? <laughs> That's what I was going to really say. I'm like, what exactly is a linger in this situation when you're filming a romance? Like, and you have an intimacy coordinator. It could and, be. I yeah. mean, we don't know. It could have been a very long exactly. linger. Well, and then the fat shaming seemed like, okay, me, I feel like that's getting a little warped. If it, this is even true or if someone just made it up, I guess he has a bad back and he went to his like personal trainer on the movie and asked how much Blake weighed and like how he could train to make sure that he doesn't injure his back because there's a scene where he has to lift her up. That wouldn't and be And then fat it got shaming. back to her and that was fat shaming. And I was like, that it sounds be, like if he that's just true, has that's a bad insane. back. Like that's so I stupid. I was like, so even if that did happen, that's not what fat shaming is. No. And I have a bad back too. I can't lift something that's 50 pounds much yeah. less like Blake's 5'10 and like <laughs> yeah that's not fat shaming but the um kissing too long so fans had gotten videos of them filming and caught a few moments that were like hmm no that doesn't that looks interesting there's one where they're kind of fighting it looks like but then also this one specifically where he seems to be getting directed by Blake on like how to grab her before they kiss like very much comes off as like she's the director here and she's like no do it like this and it yeah. doesn't seem like they're fighting but it definitely seems like okay well she's taking charge in that situation but then someone asked her about that in an interview and her answer is so like she seems just so flustered and it, it's just weird and also note how she like justin is in the question but does not like tries to avoid talking about him too much chemistry with justin also was <laughs> off the charts. I mean, really, truly, you you fell in love with both couples, you know, with Lily, with both of them. And Blake, you always have a vision. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about how sometimes you were even the intimacy coordinator in some of those sexier <laughs> scenes. Like we saw you. That shouldn't be happening, by the way. <laughs> um, I just want to be clear that <laughs> you should not be the intimacy coordinator. You should definitely hire intimacy coordinators, which we did have. Well, thank you goodness. You were teaching so. Justin how to pull you in. Where I have you seen that. this? <laughs> that clip. I actually just saw it too. It was on Instagram <laughs> yesterday, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that like, you know, not romance is really like, important. Snickering. You're supposed to, um, you know, not tell a story your, uh, oh, yeah, it's all well and make people feel, but you're also supposed to do it in a way that, um, uh, yeah, is like safe and respectful for all. Um, so yeah, I guess that's the role of intimacy coordination. But um, yeah, when I think of my involvement in the film, I don't really see that as as the, <laughs> the, the thing that I did. I did uh, probably everything else. Um, um, yeah. You touched on everything else here and there, but um, but yeah, the we back that she gets so offended it seems like that she's asked that but then she's like i did everything else but not that i mean the whole her whole vibe like, is weird i don't even know what to make of it but like yeah her like lying and being like no i i never did anything with into i mean she could have forgotten that one moment maybe she was just showing him really quick and it wasn't something she did a lot of but it's like it, i don't know she's just so defensive but interestingly, let's listen to Justin's response about the exact same clip. There's actually a clip going around, I don't know if you've seen it on Instagram, where you two are in the street and it's where you really kiss for the first time. And she's, you know, sort of showing you, like pulling you into her and showing you how to embrace her. Yeah. And people are loving that. Yeah, I mean, look. Seeing the collaborative she, effort. She, I don't think people realize how involved she was in this movie. Um, I mean, she's a producer on the film from the beginning to the end. She was extremely involved and she really made the film better. And there were many instances where I honestly just tried to get out of the way and let her take the lead. And it, especially as when, when, it, like, when it came to intimacy and all of that, like she had a very clear vision and she was telling me what she thought would work and what she thought would be sexy. And from the very beginning, this had to have a female point of view it's had to have a female gaze of course and i didn't ever want my bias as a man to um to to infiltrate or hurt the project in any way because the one thing that i don't know is what it's like to have the experience of a woman um there's nothing that i could ever do no matter how many women are in my life and, and how many women i talk to i could never embody that so trusting the women around me and trusting blake in that way to just guide me was like such a gift
Oh my God, yeah. Big difference. Crazy difference. Not even just like with not like freaking out about the crowd, like, no, I directed the movie or something. Like, and it's crazy because, like, again, like we said, maybe this is all a front. He's not really this like great guy, but yeah. he knows how to say all the right things that, like, even if you were faking it, I don't know if like he's faking it really well i know i know it's true i don't think he's faking it but it's just so weird how it's pretty clear from everything i've seen that like blake stepped on a lot of toes there whether people let yeah. her do it or not she just did it and the way that you can tell is she does it in interviews she steps on everyone's toes in the fucking room so like you can feel it she just doesn't stop talking no no. so it's literally like totally believable that she had her hands and she said it i did a little bit of everything i just feel like they're two very very different people very different and Justin's being very gracious because Blake kind of seems a little a little bit difficult to work with I will say I also think it is another relevant thing to point out that his biggest thing uh biggest project he's ever done was Jane the Virgin obviously yeah. and I was like did him and J I know Gina Rodriguez people have some issues with too for so I don't even know which she's had some problematic stuff that she said the n-word oh uh, was it yeah <laughs> Blake also was married on a plantation, which people are not happy about. <laughs> was she? Yeah, they've apologized since, but... Did they not know? That's what they said. Interesting. So she has had a history of people not necessarily loving... Or, or like, I don't know if people have outwardly said, I didn't like working with her. But like, for example, there's an infamous uh, Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants interview that has been going around again, where America Ferreira is just rolling her eyes while Blake's talking. Oh, really? She, like, is so done with her. It's kind of hilarious. If you haven't seen Gossip Girl, just about everything has happened. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> No, you'd be surprised how much hasn't happened. You know, at the end of the first season, I was like, okay, well, what what happens now? But we have um, a few more characters already in the beginning of the first season that come in and mess up our lives even more. Um, we start in the Hamptons, which is a staple of New York socialites that you haven't yet seen. Um, and, you know, we, uh, we, we all kind of dated each other, so we have to date more people or each other's parents. And, uh, Blake was in The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants? Yeah. Was she I think that was her first movie, actually. Really? Because she's also a Nepo baby. Oh, is she? <laughs> Interesting. That, that tracks. Checks out. Meanwhile, Justin, I was like, well, did he have a good... Like, I'm pretty sure he had a good relationship with his co-stars, which he literally just posted recently, that like an anniversary post with like him and some of the main people. But he literally officiated Gina Rodriguez's wedding. Oh, yeah. So they were close. So he, he doesn't have a track yeah. record of like fucking up. Exactly. And he was the love interest there. And like, he, yeah. Yeah. So to be fair, while there is that interview clip with her in America Ferreira circulating, it should be noted that they're actually still friends. And it seems like her and the other sisterhood of the Traveling Pants girls are actually all still very close. They actually even all got together uh, back in December to see a screening of Barbie to support America Ferreira. And also when America Ferreira got nominated for an Oscar for Barbie, she posted an Instagram that included screenshots of her FaceTiming the other three girls. So they're still friends too. Everyone's still friends with their co-stars, for the most part, at least. Not so much, I guess, for the Gossip Girl co-stars. Specifically, uh, people have pointed out that Penn Badgley does not follow her, but he does follow Leighton Meester and Justin Baldoni, actually. That, to me, isn't that weird because they dated also for three years. So that's not particularly strange. But um, apparently there's been a narrative going on for years now that Blake Lively and Leighton Meester do not get along. And obviously that has come up during all this. Specifically, a lot of people are referencing a piece from 2017 in Harper's Bazaar where supposedly Blake's publicist makes some comment. I went to find that article and that article cites a different website, which then cites a different website. And curiously, all of them are not available. Thank God for the Wayback Machine, because I finally found this article from CelebrityGossip.net from 2010. And apparently this quote, which is that Blake and Layton have never been best friends and never professed to be. Blake goes to work, does her job and goes home. Well, apparently that statement is in response to the National Enquirer putting out a story where a source alleges that, quote, Layton thinks Blake is an egomaniac who views her time on the TV set as slumming and Blake feels stifled. She is just ignoring her co-star because she knows bigger things are in store. So apparently that was her response. Again, this is from 2010 and obviously I don't think the National Enquirer is a very reliable source, but interesting nonetheless. So I think that was uh, one of the origins of people thinking that they hate each other, which is only still being fueled because they do not follow each other on Instagram. Anyway, 
This is probably really stupid and unimportant, but I figured we're covering everything else, so might as well throw that in there too. So this is another clip that went viral that a fan took while they were shooting, and people think it seems like they were fighting. Oh yeah, I've seen this one. To be fair, it doesn't necessarily seem like they were fighting. It seems like... It doesn't look like it's a heated exchange, but it... There Maybe have a been awkward. a few I've seen where she just looks kind of like, like, gives like kind of a frustrated, like, fine, I guess we'll do it that way. Yeah. When it's like, well, yeah, but he's the director. Aren't you supposed to do it that way? <laughs> Obviously, don't know what they're saying. Not trying to read into it too much. But Ryan Reynolds commented on that video on TikTok or on Instagram, I guess, and says, they are innocently discussing the movie. And if people respected people's privacy and not filmed the conversation without consent, then this non-story wouldn't have been a thing. Sir, your wife is being paid millions of dollars to film in public. People are going to record it. She's not a nine to five worker at fucking Target and people are just going in her face and recording her. Like there's a certain level of understanding, yes, that you're filming in public. They're not charging down a movie scene that's closed off to the public. Like they're outside of a fucking shop. That people are in. They yeah. could have closed off the whole thing if they really didn't want anybody taking pictures. This is definitely a clip that's been going viral the last few days. Start with you. Most of us, if we're lucky enough to run into a celebrity in public, we only have a few moments to maybe speak with you guys. But for people who see this movie, who relate to the topics of this movie on a deeply personal level, they're really going to want to talk to you. This movie is going to affect people and they're going to want to tell you about their lives. So if someone understands the themes of this movie, comes across you in public, uh, and, and they want to really talk to you, what's the best way for them to be able to talk to you about this? How would you recommend they go about like it? Like asking for like my address or my phone number or like my location share. Or I could just location share you and then we could, uh, <laughs> I'm just curious. Just about social about security like, number. It looks like he wants to die. His face, people zoom into it in a few of the like He literally looks so fucking miserable. Holy shit. And especially that she just made a joke. So like, normally you chuckle or like a pity little snort out your nose something give us something but when this is the answer like how should people that maybe resonate with like the domestic violence themes of this movie and they want to come up to you and talk to you about it her answer <laughs> super weird i also think the question's a little bit weird if i'm being honest yeah well she's not a domestic violence expert yeah and also it's just like you know you don't really want to tell people what to i mean i've had people come up to me about certain situations and like what i guess i would have said in that scenario is like listen if it feels right and you feel compelled to tell me something like that's totally fine i think that it's just a slippery slope because it's like with her she's playing a character who went through that she's not someone who did for sure so for it's sure. definitely a little bit different but that being said her answer sucks ass like, it's just like well that's i was like at the very least like how long have you been like been in this industry you should know how to spin a question to be like make it give them a non-answer you, turn, you take it anything. back to the movie yeah exactly you don't have exactly. to answer that exact question just give us something while I do think this maybe wasn't the most appropriate time for sarcasm, I do think that uh, most people don't realize that she actually did go on to answer the question, which I will play for you now. Are we talking logistics? Are we talking emotionally? We yeah, what's been beautiful about this movie is that, like, unfortunately, we all know at least someone, but we, we normally know, like, a lot more than some ones. We, love, we know some many's who have experienced this. And um, it's, the, the beauty of this has been to see people and to see this movie alongside women who um, haven't experienced this, thank goodness, go, whoa, it was, I, I fell in love too. I, I, I saw the red flags, but they didn't look red. They looked kind of fuchsia and cute. But like, you know, I ignored them and I see why. And the story is told with such empathy that I feel like this movie can be healing, it can be a cautionary tale, and it can also just, and it can be inspiring. So I think that the movie itself and Colleen's work itself does that work. And and for anyone, if anyone ever comes up to you and says that, that your work meant something to them outside of just having that collective experience in a theater where you laugh and cry and feel together, like, what a blessing. Like, what, you know, the fact that we get to do this and it gets to mean something is like, yeah, is really significant. And I think this does speak to how a lot of her clips are being taken because she has done a lot of interviews at this point. And I think people are kind of picking and choosing what they're taking from them. Do I agree that she has made some interesting choices? Yes, but I also think people aren't seeing the clips in their entirety and taking into account that there's more than just the TikToks you're seeing. I also just think 
it's wild that in several of these interviews, like, why is she sitting like that? Especially in that out. Well, she wants to show us it's Louboutins, I think, is what's happening. Okay, not, oh my god, <laughs> not to cut, not get sidetracked because it is oh relevant, god. but should we watch the other one that's come out, her rude interview? Oh, right. This isn't for this movie, though. This was several years ago, yeah. but when you look at all of her interviews for this movie, it's crazy to see in the contrast of how she acts. Basically, she's talking about her fashion this entire press tour. Like, every single interview I've seen, she is mentioning her clothes. And her hair care line. Yes, that. But so just a couple days ago, this interview resurfaced, and it's from 2016, and it's an interview with her and Parker Posey for some movie called Cafe Society that I've absolutely never heard of. Keep in mind, it is apparently a period piece. So, like, the fashion in this movie was, like, something outside of the norm. Basically, the fashion played a role in the film. So this interview is insane. First of all, congrats on your little bump. Uh, congrats on your little bump. <laughs> <laughs> what about my bump? <laughs> So that first off, that's insane. That's fucking insane. She was saying congrats on your pregnancy and then you like told her she was fat, basically. Yeah, it's weird because I know that celebrities have their weird things about pregnancy and like don't mention it. But I'm pretty sure at that point it must have been public information that she was pregnant. Like, exactly. The interview like, wasn't she wasn't like, speculating. Yeah, it wasn't hey, like, you look a little pregnant. Are you expecting today? Like, no. Yeah, absolutely not. So that's so already weird. To say it back is weird. And then the other lady who's with her, I don't know who she is, but she seems drunk. Parker Posey always seems a little erratic. So <laughs> I really wasn't too surprised by that. But what happens next is just like, what are you doing? Like, that lady didn't do anything to you. You've got <laughs> two nice ones. And these, they are kind of bumps, aren't they? No, not bumps. The lovely lady lumps. Check okay. it out. Thank you. Thank you. Are you like the movie? Are you a Woody Allen fan? I love most of his movies. And this one was so like... Not Woody Allen. Amazing. Yeah, that's another thing. Blake Lively has like spoken about how she like loves Woody Allen. Fun. I think I saw a TikTok Becca posted too that she's like super involved with Balenciaga in some way as well, which is yeah, fun. Yeah. yeah. Seems like and, a great um, lady. I guess has like said to speak to her Nepo baby start that I guess she has spoken about like she had a good experience with Harvey Weinstein. I'm Aww. like... So happy okay. for you, Blake. Maybe just keep that to yourself. Yeah, <laughs> literally. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Did you guys love wearing those kind of clothes that you... Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, working in Everyone digital... Everyone wants to talk about the clothes, but I wonder if they would ask the men about the clothes. I would. I love oh, no. Jesse's suit. Watch her proceed to ignore this woman completely, like, does not look at her and is just having a side conversation with Parker and pretending like that was a super, like, misogynistic, gross question that was sexualizing her or something. Like, oh, it shit. was a period She piece. just posted this four days ago. Yeah. That's why it's resurfacing. Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. That's what I'm saying. His, his wardrobe was beautiful. Oh, I know. Corey's wardrobe was I know. gorgeous. He's Those so high-waisted pants. He's so great. I, I would wish men wore high-waisted too. pants like I know. that still. Me or too. the father with his with his his tank top in oh, bed. Oh, so good! Just like, it's just like Did that. You, catch you could the, feel the it. The tablecloth on the on the light in the Italian restaurant oh, when they eat spaghetti. I didn't notice that. that. No. That there's yeah, so much like, warmth of everything. Oh my God. You know? Yeah, it's not just the women that, that <clears throat> have the clothes. But I, mean, Victoria, I feel like the women get the conversation, but it's like yeah. every detail with everybody. But yeah, it's so, it was so amazing beautiful. to look at. Steve's and then to white see it, suits. Yes. And then you notice in LA, like everybody's in cream colors and all the men are wearing like white and cream. And then mm -hmm. you get to New York and it's a little bit more browns and moodier. And, and Susie really told such a... Why is she having a conversation with Parker as if this lady is not there? Why well, is she trying to be a That bitch. was a rude question. Like 100%. Uh, clearly. Like, it is insane to me when that I was, was watching so this. That is so fucking rude. But then, when you juxtapose it with all of her interviews during this fucking movie, it's insane. Before we continue on, we really quickly want to thank today's second sponsor, and that's Lola V. If you're unfamiliar, Lola V is a hair care line by the one, the only, Jennifer Aniston, who, I mean, if anyone's coming up with a hairline, I feel like it should be her. She has iconic hair. The Rachel. She does. One thing I love about Lola V is it's all naturally derived, plant-based ingredients, no silicone sulfates, parabens, gluten, and of course, it's cruelty-free and vegan, so all the good stuff go into the shampoo, but I honestly, I love the way it smells too. Just a side note, it's like a little spa treatment every single time I'm in the shower. And I said 
but this last time it has such good like lather mm -hmm. a lot of suds come up it feels like you're really like you don't have to use a ton to feel like you are actually getting a lot in there they have this awesome in shower trio which is the restorative shampoo and conditioner and then the intensive repair treatment which leaves your hair feeling really soft afterwards and that helps with damage from coloring heat styling stress aging you know all of the things that all of us are probably experiencing or maybe is it just me so if you guys want to unlock jennifer aniston approved hair you can head over to lolavie.com and we do of course have a special deal for our listeners which is 15 percent off your entire order when you use code dwkt at checkout that's 15 percent off your order at lolavie.com it's l-o-l-a-v-i-e.com and use the promo code DWKT. Just a side note, you can only use one promo code per order and you can't combine this code with anything else. But when you do place your order, they're gonna ask where you heard about them and it helps us out a lot if you let them know the girly sent you. So thank you so much to Lola V for being an amazing sponsor of this podcast. First of all, Blake has always been like known for fashion. So like, that's not weird to ask. This is what's actually hilarious though. Guess what this woman went on to do? Oh God, what? <laughs> She's now the chief executive officer and founder of the Academy of Fashion Arts and Sciences. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, I'm like, hmm, guess who's not going to be uh, receiving any awards? I don't think. <laughs> this one I thought in particular was just a great juxtaposition because it's like, you really acted like you didn't want to be asked about fashion and that was like an offensive question, but then here we go. You've been wearing a lot of really cool flowery outfits for this because of course you play a florist. Can you talk us through that little number? That looks great. Oh, it's so cute. Do you want to see? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to stand up. It's oh skirt. my gosh. It's painted. It's a leather uh, vintage like pencil skirt. And then this is a top that's printed from the painted Dauphinette. She's a New York City designer. That one's bang on brand, isn't it? Yes, lots of flowers. You're yeah. wearing flowers. I mean, I didn't have anyone to paint my outfit, but yeah. I've done my best. Yeah. I love it. Now, oh my God. And the way he asked, I mean, no offense to him, but just be like, what's that little number? Like it's way more like, doesn't care at all about this though. And like you said, they're apparently, I mean, I've never seen Cafe Society, but if the shit they were wearing was distinct in the movie, that's insane that it that was It took place reaction. in like the twenties. Wow. All right, like, well. She was asking for a reason, and because obviously, based on her career now, she was like interested in fashion. Like it wasn't a throwaway. Yeah. So that I think is insane. And that definitely has been going viral for the other reason too, is just her being a like, just such an intentional bitch about right. everything. Like that poor woman. <laughs> Do you have any favorite clips we should go over? I know the Taylor Swift song and the Lana Del Rey song was a big thing that people were talking about and like making it seem like she was making executive choices for the movie. And this one also fueled the idea that there was like some conflicts going on behind the scenes. I did also <laughs> scream when I heard Cherry by Lana Del Rey. Right? Yeah. Scream. They begged me to take that movie out, that song out of the movie. Why? I'm not supposed to be talking about this, <laughs> but um, because they felt like it was um, like too charged and heavy and things are still good with Ryle at that point. So you don't want to feel that charge. And I was like, the moment Atlas enters, things are charged and yeah. heavy. Like it, what, there's, there's conflict, there's pain, there's turmoil, there's tension because you're like, oh my God my soulmate, the one that mm -hmm. got away in my life, this person who's haunting me and everything I do and everywhere yeah. I go is here now and yeah. we still had that connection. Yeah. And you can be deeply in love with this person, but this person comes in and you're like, your insides are gonna be a mess. Yeah. So that's why. Because right, and people who like she... are fans of Lana Del Rey, I, I'm not super familiar with her music, were commenting on how the song that Blake got put in the movie, Cherry, is like, it was super random and like felt super weird and off. Exactly. But Some people were like, oh my God, I loved that that song was in it just because they loved the song. But I right. guess a lot of people are saying it did not fit like the scene at all. And she is very vocal. Like I have literally um, six, and I'm sure there's more, six different interview clips different occasions where she is talking about how involved she was in like getting certain songs in it. And it seems like she very much cashed in her friend card with Taylor Swift because also she has uh, in the IMDb thing, it says like that there's like a special thanks section and like Justin Baldoni, I think says a special thanks to his wife. And she has like special thanks to Taylor Swift, Austin Swift, a guy that I looked up and he's one of the main producers on like most of Taylor Swift's albums and like a composer. She has like 10 different thank yous. And she talks in one of the things about how like she had to call in a lot of favors because this was like a low budget. This, this wasn't a big Hollywood summer movie. Did you have to make some calls? 
There were a lot of calls made for a lot of songs in this movie. Honestly, like this movie, I think that like when you see it, it feels like a big, beautiful summer movie, but like we didn't have any budget. Um, so there were a lot of favors and a lot of begging. And um, uh, uh, were your knees for Taylor? Um, I mean, honestly, she, she was with me on this experience the whole time, all throughout it. So like she really lived this with me. Um, so uh, yeah, she was, you know, she's a, a person who shows up for you and I'm so grateful to have that love and that support but um but yeah there were other other people too that I had to call and beg and people that said no um but I don't know what that means so if somebody has a dictionary I would love to find the definition of that it's so confusing to me uh, no no I just we just begged to get a lot of the songs in the movie songs that we couldn't afford but um but people I was just like please see the movie it's just I think you'll want to be a part of it because um, we all just want to connect with people. We're all storytellers, and um, so yeah, really proud of the soundtrack in this movie. I know it was between that and then her talking about how she borrowed clothes from Gigi Hadid, and then also like whenever an interviewer's like, "I loved that thing that you were wearing in the movie," she's like, "That's mine. That's mine. It's mine. That's why you like it because it's mine." <laughs> I just really loved those patchwork like jeans mm -hmm. that you had, Magnolia Pearl. Oh yeah. Those are my real life jeans. Yeah, a lot yeah. of that is like mm -hmm. your stuff. The boots were mine. Oh, I love them. Um, there's these great Louboutins that are also a close up on them when we're dancing in the bar. Those are mine. Um, I have a few of my husband's shirts and socks randomly in the movie. Um, I have some of Gigi Hadid's sweaters in the movie. Oh, that um, pink one. Yeah, I love that. she has like so she has this line guest in residence, but also like she would run out, and I would be like, I want this one because all the like really cool patterns and whatnot. So she was like, I, I have that. You can wear mine. Um, so some of that, and um, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of my stuff. Well, that's, it's just she, so according awkward. to Blake, she was like the stylist, the music uh, supervisor. She also styled her younger, the girl that plays her younger self, Isabella. That is very known. Like they talk about that a lot. Did I overhear you saying that Blake styled you tonight? She did. Yeah. Yes. She did style me. This is all her doing. I have an Oscar de la Renta dress on in classic Blake fashion. This is Lorraine Schwartz on my arms and the jewels here on my ears. I'm wearing her shoes. These are her Louboutin shoes. Yes. She's been an absolute angel and a mentor and a big sister to me. And yeah, a new best friend. I, I don't know where I'd be without her. What I will say, though, I did see a lot of people who read the book, and obviously this is not as important as her kind of ignoring the DV aspect of it, but a lot of people were saying that her interpretation of the clothes kind of ruined it for them because they say that, like, Lily Bloom wouldn't dress like that. Like That she was apparently this, like... a huge point of contention, like, way before any of this, before okay. any kind of feud with Justin was coming up. People were really not happy with the casting choices because I guess in the book, they're much, much younger and Justin and her much older, but yeah. whatever, that's a choice they made. But then a lot of people said Blake didn't fit Lily to begin with, but then also the clothes were just like a total miss. Yeah. One thing that I do remember right now, it's coming to my head, is her being asked, I don't know what, maybe it was the premiere about the DV aspect of it. And her response was kind of insane to me. Like, I was just like, what? I have a few of them. <laughs> oh, okay. There so, you go. So, um, because that's, it's such a stark difference between any time Justin is asked about it, where he very much leans in and talks about how, like, important it is to, like, honor that part of the story and make sure it's done right. And her main sentiment that she communicates anytime she's asked about it is, like, yeah, it's about domestic violence, but you're more than just a victim. You're more, and she like is trying to come off as being like empowering, but it's kind of dismissive at the same time. So to me, um, it wasn't, I didn't look at any one thing in her life because I think she's so much more than this thing that happened to her. And yes, it can, it can change the course of her life, but it doesn't define her. She defines herself. And that to me is really, really beautiful. She's not a victim and she's not a survivor. Well, she may be a victim and she may be a survivor. She's also m multitudes. And I think that, um, to not be defined by the men in her life, whether it be her father, whether it be this beautiful love that she has, or whether it be this toxic love that she has she's never defined by the men in her life and i think that that's a beautiful story for any gender and for any age um so yeah it's so much more than while that thing is very big and very potent and there's a lot of responsibility and care that that needs to be handled with so, so never to diminish that but this movie is so much more than any one thing i mean this story um is one that that covers uh it it covers domestic abuse domestic violence but it also covers um, 
somebody having a lifelong dream and and realizing it and making it a reality it it covers your first love it covers a new love it covers um the highs and lows and and every color of the human experience so for me it felt very clear um what i wanted to do and how i wanted to do it because it was just it captured the messiness of the human experience and i felt very honest and very real and very raw and i understood why lily made the decisions that she made when she made them. you mean when blake made the decisions she made when she made them <laughs> that's, you don't that's like she just lily. anytime she gets asked she kind of gets into this like monologue spiral where she's just like listing off adjectives and words <laughs> it's like well and the thing is that it's like i said about the movie just because it's not a constant abuse movie you're not a witnessing abuse constantly that is abuse. like that is how abuse works there's lulls they come back they say they love you so much that's why a lot of times people stay they have jobs they have dreams they have children they have happy moments in between that like it's not just 24 7 abuse for a lot of people and it's i don't know it's just weird that she's just like yeah okay it's about abuse, but it's about a dream and it's like you can have a dream exactly. and be abused. Like those things can coexist and happen. And like she kind of gets it because she's like the messiness of the human experience. But at the same time, doesn't really understand that because she doesn't understand like what a does and how it makes it way fucking messier. Like it's not just something that's thrown in there. It's like, I don't know. Exactly. I, I just feel like she doesn't get it her emotional roadmap was so strong and so potent. And what was important to me for Lily is that she didn't come into it from a delicate uh, place that she didn't come into it as somebody who was super vulnerable or susceptible to um, to someone coming in and overwhelming her and traumatizing her. That she came in with real spice and sass and agency, and she had both feet on the ground and her head screwed on tight. And you know she's she's. Um, She's uh, full of like levity and life and humor, but this is also a little jaded given what she's experienced in her life. And she's open and vulnerable. She has all of those colors, but she's not a delicate flower. She's not a wilting lily. She is a strong, uh, empowered woman. So she's someone that you would look at and go, well, especially given her history, you know, she comes from a, f a family uh, that, you know, a childhood that has some trauma in it. And, and you see her say, well, that's never going to be me. And, and then you meet her as an adult and go, yeah, she means it. She, she knows what to look out for. She's not going to repeat those patterns. And then when she does, it's that much more devastating. And it shows that this could happen to anyone. And it, and it, and it does. Like, you know, I think that oftentimes when I, when I think of um, films that have portrayed, you know, um, I mean, we'll call it what it is. It's, it's, you know, violence against women. You, they often paint a picture that's a bit more black and white where this person is clearly the villain and this woman is clearly the victim. And you could see like, how could she possibly experience that at this person's hands? Um, or when she does experience it, she's out right away and has a revelation. You don't normally see, um, how, how, how gray it can be and how confusing it can be and how you can be a woman with confidence and agency and know better and still not see all of the red flags um, that you should. Here's another one from the premiere where she words it a little different, but same kind of vibe. Oh, this is the one I was talking about, yeah. This movie covers domestic violence, but what's important about this film is that she is not just a survivor and she's not just a victim. And while those are huge things to be, they're not her identity. She's not defined by something that someone else did to her or an event that happened to her, even if it's multiple events. She is, she defines herself. And I think that that's deeply empowering to remind people that no one else can define you. No experience can define you, you define you. You really feel like we delivered a story that's emotional and it's fun and it's funny and it's painful and it's scary and it's tragic and it's inspiring and that's what life is it's like i get what she's saying but it does seem to just miss the like no no one's saying that it defines them but the whole movie is about how she comes to terms with the fact that it's happening to her because she didn't like not all 
abuse victims even will register that that's what's happening in the moment. Like what their limits are are always evolving. And, and she doesn't want to talk about that. She's just like, no, it's not. A, it's it's about being an independent she's woman. She's trying to be empowering. And, and what I do understand is like, I've never been through DV, but you know, I consider myself a survivor in certain aspects in life. And I think that I've battled with that for a while. But what I've come to terms with is that there was a long period of time in my life where I couldn't choose to overcome something. Like I didn't get to just be like, you know what? I'm so much more than a survivor. That that wasn't a choice. Like it was all consuming. It was everything that I was. It's everything I thought about all day, every day. There are a lot of people who are experiencing abuse where you can't just choose to be like, you know what? I'm going to go slay life and I am a survivor. It's like, Okay, I feel like it's dismissive and the experience is unique to every single person. And if you're someone that's been through abuse and you want to not like talk about it, like I don't talk about my thing all the time. Like it's just something that sometimes will not even be thought about for months at a time. And then I'm like, oh my God, that's right. And it manifests in different ways and people have very unique experiences with things that happen to them. It's just weird and annoying. And it just seems like she doesn't understand it, which is why I think people are taking it the wrong way. Cause it's just like, oh my God, thank you, queen. I could just like not think about it and just like focus yeah. on my dreams. No, like, that's period. <laughs> the main sentiment I've seen in like comment sections is like, as a victim of DV, she clearly doesn't get it. The thing is that the whole message of the movie is supposed to serve as like, not a reminder to be like, slay queen. It's like, if your limits are always evolving and like what you're okay with. It's trying to empower people to realize that they can end the cycle. It ends with us. Like that is the title of the movie. Yeah, and it, it's and just, just fucking like, insane when you think about, I mean, spoiler alert for the book, but from what I've heard, she gets pregnant due to SA. And like, that's how she had her baby and decided to end that cycle and that is super intense like that is you just don't think that that's what she's talking about when she's being interviewed it just doesn't match up with Justin Baldoni like you see his entire kind of like aura just like you know come down to where it needs to be to discuss a topic like this and she's just like oh my god like here I am at this movie premiere let's talk about it like it's just I don't know she's just not there in the topic and I think that's why people are feeling like she doesn't give a fuck about it I totally forgot I have a compilation that compares the two that's perfect oh there you go this is your night mister no this this isn't my night this is oh my a god. night for all the women who we made this movie for this is a night for Blake this is so much and when you're touched and moved by something like as as deeply as I was by this book it just kind of comes naturally yes this is a movie about love and hope but that we don't shy away from the issue to it but about the why behind it if a lily bloom in real life can sit in this theater and maybe make a different choice for herself than was made for her maybe she sees herself on that screen and chooses something different for herself that's why I made it. Somebody who's in this situation, or we read a book, or we or we hear a news story, the question that's always asked is, why did she stay? Mm. And that's the wrong question. Yeah. What we need to be asking ourselves is, why do men harm? Well, this is Britney's Versace dress. Uh, <laughs> Stop it. 2002, the butterfly it. dress. And this dress meant so much to me. Um, it meant so much to me because of what she meant to me. Like, she was just somebody who represented love and beauty and youth and hard work and determination and strength and she was in touch with her sexuality and her she defines herself and I think that that's deeply empowering to remind people that no one else can define you no experience can define you you define you you really feel like we delivered a story that's emotional and it's fun and it's funny and it's painful and it's scary and it's tragic and it's inspiring any other words Literally you want to throw in there adjectives to yeah, me like, when I'm trying I, to read that, <laughs> reach the essay word count. There's a stark difference between how the I two of them cried have handled it. Watching Justin. Yeah. That's beautiful. I and know. again, even if he's faking it, he's doing it quite well, I must say. But that's like, the thing. And like, listen to him talking about, um, even he addresses that people think it's glorified in the film. He like even acknowledges them. <laughs> I think that they are absolutely uh, entitled to that opinion. And it makes perfect sense as to why they would feel that way. I mean, Look, we live in a culture where, uh, unfortunately, too many things are glorified. And, uh, you know, we are fighting for attention. We're in an attention economy and we're in a clickbait world and everybody is trying to, you know, uh, figure out how to, how to gather attention, look at the news cycle. It's everywhere around us. Um, and so it makes perfect sense that people would feel that way. Um, also, if anybody has had that real life experience, um, I can imagine how hard it would be to imagine their experience being in a romance novel. To them, I would just offer that um, 
that we were very intentional in the making of this movie. I'm like, again, if he's faking, then fuck. He is a great, he's a great actor because he seems to just really get it. And then when talking even about, because his character is the one that he's responsible for the abuse, as someone you would think that it, the, like is very all about like dismantling toxic masculinity, that is going to be a hard thing. And even the way he talks about it, like I get emotional listening. I think all of the scenes showcasing um, uh, gender-based violence, I think that, that was very hard for me. I almost had to step out of my body. There were a lot of times, um, I mean, even thinking about it is hard. Uh, there were a lot of times where I, I would have to go privately into a room and just cry or shake it out and try to get him out of me and that energy out of me because uh, it's too real. And there are, uh, there, there are too many people that are the real life Lily Blooms of the world that have to deal with that every single day. And I wanted it to be as real as possible and yet uh, it, was, it, was, it was very hard. Uh, to shoot those scenes. Um, but luckily, the only way it was possible is, you know, I had an incredible intimacy coordinator. I had an incredible stunt coordinator. Both of them were women. And then there was Blake, who, honestly, between those three women, they really were the ones choreographing and navigating all of those scenes because I was step I needed to play Ryle. And in those moments, to be perfectly frank, I really wasn't the director. It was those women that were, uh, that were in charge. And from the beginning, I wanted all the intimate scenes to be from a female gaze. And I never wanted my bias to potentially, you know, interject and go into the film. So I kind of stepped back and felt all the things and allowed myself to do the work and, um, and shook it off as best I could. It's just like, he gets it. Yeah, I think they both are like repeating themselves a lot, which is like what you do on a press tour. You essentially just regurgitate the same thing yeah, and all over the place. And you ask all the same questions, I get it. Yeah, but um, they have very clear stances at the same time. She is vibing with her hair care line and her fashion and she's just chilling. And she's like not ignoring the DV questions. I think that she's just not doing them justice and definitely- She's not gonna be the one to bring it up. I wonder how she feels now with all of this coming out. Cause I feel like it's clear. She was very comfortable in those interviews. She was like thinking she was slaying. And now I'm just, she's probably just like, oh shit, everybody fucking hates me. It's funny you say that. So the hair care line, first of all. So the movie came out August 9th. The premiere was August 6th. And all the junket interviews that we've been seeing all started like August 4th. That was the same day that her hair brand came out was, or it, that it was available in stores. She had only announced it like five days earlier, July 31st. Like that's all she's talking about for the next two days. But then she starts the press stuff. And I know she mentions it in interviews as well. Apparently in just a week, there were reports that her media impact value, apparently that's like a metric you can measure. On August 14th, launch metrics reveals that Blake's hair care line has generated $16 million in media impact value within one week. I just don't know what media impact value actually equates to in real money. So I don't either, little... but it says it's a proprietary metric that assigns a true monetary value to marketing strategies across print, online and social media in order to calculate return on investment. So it's basically saying like the amount of like marketing she has put into it is worth $16 million because it's gotten so much attention because of the movie as well. I wonder if it's just because of the movie or it's also like aren't people like kind of clowning on her for promoting it in interviews and stuff? Good question. I don't know if it's all like if the media attention around it, if it's negative. If that, yeah, like it could be impressions, that but I think a lot of those press. impressions at this point are not good. Hi girlies. So I asked my bestie ChatGPT and it says that media impact value is a way to measure how much attention or buzz a brand or product gets from media coverage. And that includes media coverage, social media, news articles, and influencer posts. So it's basically the equivalent of how much it would cost to get that amount of attention if a brand was paying for ads instead of earning it through media coverage. It measures overall visibility and engagement regardless of whether the attention is positive or negative. Like but regardless, it. the fact like that definitely checks out with like, this was a planned launch. She definitely wanted this to coincide with it. I even had read at one point that like back to the Deadpool Wolverine, like simultaneous promo that they were kind of like piggybacking off each other. Cause she also is like, at least her voice. I don't know if it's her body cause she's in a suit. She's in that movie as well as like Lady Pool. So she mentions that randomly. She mentions Ryan in an interview. She mentions Deadpool in interviews just very casually. Like she'll be answering a question and she'll like interject like, oh my God, Deadpool poster over there. Why is Deadpool Wolverine sold out? I'm sorry, I got distracted back there. Um, I feel offended, but we're not out yet. That's fine. Um, I'm happy about that. The biggest, no, I didn't even answer it. Sorry, I really, it's like flashing sold out. Hello. 
Oh my gosh, Timothy Chalamet, Ken, Harry Styles. I don't see my husband anywhere on here. This is so confusing. It meant so much to me. Oh my God, my husband's getting soaking wet in the rain. Um, it meant so much to but um, that supposedly they, I mean, not supposedly, they did push the release of this movie to coincidentally maybe or strategically come out. So it was within the same box office window as Deadpool. So that's like together they're like the two movies were trying to be like um, supposedly like a what, what, Barbenheimer. <laughs> So that was like they wanted this to be that and definitely were like using their power coupleness to do so. That is all speculation. Obviously, they have not confirmed that. But because she is a producer and clearly had a lot of pull and like had her hands in every single aspect of the movie, it's not hard to believe that she might have been like, oh, my God, what if we just pushed a little bit? Because it was like literally a, uh, like a month, not even. Yeah. Well, it seems like she controlled everything else in the movie. So that wouldn't be too hard to do that. Exactly. So another thing that Blake got a lot of backlash for was in addition to her hairline, she also has two beverage lines. There's Betty Booze, which is alcohol, obviously. And then there's Betty Buzz, which is sparkling soda. And it seems like she saw an opportunity because both of those brands partnered with the movie and did a pop up where they took over a florist and made their own Lily Blooms. But it wasn't Lily Blooms, it was Betty Blooms, which is up for all of August. Also, they sell it online. They had flower arrangements that the vases were the bottles that she uses for the Betty Buzz soda. So people had some thoughts about that, but people had a lot more thoughts on the fact that both Betty Booze and Betty Buzz seemed to partner with the movie for their official after party. This probably wouldn't have been that much of a problem if they hadn't come up with signature cocktails for each of the characters that they would serve at the after party. Post premiere Buzz and Booze are our favorite kinds of Buzz and Booze. We brought flavors and florals together. Well, of course they did. For an It Ends With Us themed menu that serves as beautiful as it drinks recipes for it ends with us cocktails below and then it lists the signature cocktails that they are offering there's blooming betty rile you wait yes there is a signature cocktail based on the abusive character in the movie yeah then there's it ends with ah which isn't even a good pun but i digress and also tom colleen's because of Colleen Hoover. Then they also say that if you need something a little easier that's just as tasty, pick up some Betty Buzz mocktails for the young Atlas or Lilies in your life, or Betty Booze cocktails for the adult Atlas and Lilies. Some deliciousness, but with a little spirit. That's a joke about cocktails. They also posted these drinks on their social media with the recipes so people at home could drink too. And it looks like for the after party, um, they grabbed their florals and their friends and promoted the shit out of Betty Booze and Betty Buzz. And I also noticed a quick but convenient shot of none other than Aviation Gin, which is the gin company that Ryan Reynolds owns. Needless to say, it seems like they definitely got their promo out of this movie and people were not happy. The comments are... Pretty ruthless. Why are they using a movie about DV to promote drinks? Seriously? This is so inappropriate and disgusting. The World Health Organization estimates that roughly 55% of domestic perpetrators were drinking alcohol prior to assault. Women who are abused are 15 times more likely to abuse alcohol. Alcohol is a fuel to domestic violence episodes. What were you thinking? Have some respect for DV survivors. You used a movie that includes domestic violence to promote your alcoholic beverage line and hair care line. This is distasteful and tone deaf. Do better or don't star slash produce movies that include sensitive topics like DV. Did y'all really do a cutesy cocktail named after Ryle, the literal abuser in this story? Yikes. These go on for a while, but here's the last one I'll read. As a domestic violence survivor, this is offensive. It's not cute. Please don't girly pop violence. I don't see anything saying you donated money. And even if you did, this is in poor taste. Way to capitalize by any means necessary. Yeah. Anyway, that's it. Back to us. And Sony, who is the one, like, Justin's production company made the movie, but Sony then bought the rights to promote it, and Sony is up her ass. Literally, like, they have an article where they are literally praising her. The Sony chief praises, like, for advancing the conversation around DV. Oh my god, please. Give me a break. Does not even mention Justin in the interview. It says, Blake, Colleen, and so many women put so much effort into this remarkable movie, working selflessly from the start to ensure that such an important subject matter was handled with care. 
Her passion and commitment to advancing the conversation around domestic violence is commendable. We love working with Blake. We want to do 12 more movies with her. I bet yeah, you do. Yeah, I know. A lot of things can be said about her, but that's complete bullshit. Like, she is not advancing any conversation at all from the comments anything I I've saw seen. on that. We're like, are the conversations in the room with us right yeah, now? Like, no, what, what conversations are you even talking about? So that's interesting. That came out um, August 14th. So did a hit piece about Justin that we touched on earlier, the TMZ, where he's fat shaming her, supposedly. After all of the premiere interviews had all come out and all of the stuff, like, it, the feud was really, like, front and center. People started switching to being like, oh, what did Justin Baldoni do? To suddenly now it was like, oh. Well, no, it seems like Blake and Ryan like steamrolled him over his movie and like he wanted to like preserve the artistic integrity and they wanted to make it a box office hit. It was only after all of the backlash for her started that on August 13th, she finally posts an Instagram story where she links to uh, DV resources. That's insane. But she doesn't say anything like it's not like a heartfelt message from her. It's like a statistic and a link. Oh my God. That is so annoying, actually. I mean, it's and not it annoying five that she's days after the movie was released. But like, just, oh, that seems so performative and unfortunate. I know. And specifically, the thing that also is weird about the Justin Baldoni thing, because if it was just based on a few TMZ articles and whatever, it'd kind of be like, that's probably made up. And like, just from what we've seen in the interviews and how she's really like, taken control of like the interviews themselves and also bragging about how much like she had not even bragging but kind of being like I had to do so much like I had to pick up the slack the way she talks about all the fashion especially not very relatable like it's very much like she's like no but I I use these Louis Vuittons blah blah, blah. and I'm thinking like a florist can afford Louis Vuittons <laughs> Oh, I got this Britney Spears Versace gown at a vintage shop. And it's like, I don't know who you're really appealing to now. She's not relatable. And I think that a lot of people, again, the DV thing is a huge aspect that I don't want to get lost in because there's a lot of like co-star drama, like people are, are just speculating on, obviously separate from that. But I think that the main thing that people are taking away is like, oh wait, Blake Lively is not likable at all. She is giving J-Lo. She unfortunately is. That's, I've endless comments about how she's the best thing to ever happen to J-Lo. <laughs> oh no, you know J-Lo's just like basking in it. I mean, she's always going to be back. Don't don't get too excited. But uh, yeah, no, Blake is definitely just being seen as someone that doesn't seem very fun to be around, which is simultaneously probably going to fuck with Ryan Reynolds because he is like, quote unquote, relatable king. That's very funny and very, you know, down to earth. I think it just kind of uh, gave people a different perspective of people that they thought were like a super relatable down to earth couple. For sure. And I think a couple factors maybe play into that because people are like how did we not know sooner and I'm like I think one she didn't do that many like she didn't act she took like a break from acting to work on her hair care line which then she uses this movie to promote but then um she just hasn't ever been that much in like the interview like talking about the movies and stuff she's in like she's not been as involved whether they wouldn't let her or she just like wasn't at that place well, I but mean, i think that interview that we Ryan saw really was from years themselves. ago and we never saw that so i feel like maybe that's not true either though like i feel like there are probably interviews out there maybe people just really didn't give a shit to watch blake lively in interviews well that's the thing it's everyone kind of looked at her as like a fashion and hair icon and they weren't really caring yeah. for what she was saying but also i just don't think she was like being spotlighted as much also i think just her and ryan reynolds have really like leaned into this like couple persona yeah. that they've built and she feels more comfortable and i think she really thinks she killed it with this movie. The thing concerning about Justin Baldoni is that he apparently on August 13th news broke that he had hired Melissa Nathan, who's like a famous PR crisis manager. And she used to work for a company that for like a decade, they like did all the strategies for Johnny Depp. And then I, I guess her clients now at her new one that she just started are Drake, Logan Paul, the chain smokers, like all people that have had very much like they needed to fix something because Dude, they did something she didn't wrong. just represent Johnny Depp. She it says here she represented him during the Amber Heard trial. Like, yeah, in the craziest fucking time to represent Johnny yeah, Depp. Yeah, and then he followed her to her new, um, from the old Oh, wow. Workout. Okay, so that's who, mm, that's weird, Justin. I, it's, he's in very bad company. So it's like, yeah. I don't know. They could have other clients that just aren't publicly known that aren't scum. But it seems like the ones that are listed are very much like, 
oh shit i feel like, like he would know that too and it says they specialize in communications crisis reputation management personal publicity and digital team services across entertainment blah blah blah. i feel like he's not even in a pr crisis right now i feel like people are i mean on though he side. is because of these hit pieces that are coming out like one of the first ones was daily mail saying that he was borderline abusive on set and like it's crazy because everything these articles say are the opposite of what he has said in the interviews, which, again, is he lying? Because it goes against everything that he has publicly stood for. He has no crisis in his interviews. Like, he hasn't said anything that's bad. And no one has directly come out and said anything was bad with him. Yeah. I just don't really know how common it is to hire someone like that if you didn't actually do something wrong. I guess even if he didn't do anything wrong and it's being pushed that he is, like someone is clearly feeding these stories and is like out to get him. I don't know. I don't think Blake Lively is necessarily like giving people the okay and directing them to do it. But it seems like there is a push from someone to villainize him because they're doing ep- like fat shaming. Yeah, it seems weird. But it again, it is so interesting that so many people, that... like all the other co-stars, also don't follow him on Instagram. And so if it's not just Blake that had an issue with him, that is interesting. I don't know what it means. I, I don't think it's productive necessarily to try to like figure it out because we don't know. But it is interesting. I don't know. The other aspect about that that I have seen a lot of people obviously speculating on and who knows if there's any truth to it. But logically when you ask like well if he didn't do something why would they be siding with Blake and to that a lot of people are like well she's married to Ryan Reynolds she is the one with the power she is the one that took control of the movie Sony loves her also not to bring Taylor Swift into this but like being besties with Taylor Swift and like they just as a couple her and Ryan have a lot of connections that it's like why wouldn't a smaller actor want to like be on the side of the person that they know is going to be able to bring them more success too if they play along. And I'm not saying that that is the case, but that is what a lot of people are speculating. The only interview I've seen where someone is weird about Justin Baldoni specifically is, besides Blake that is, is Jenny Slate. And she gives the, like this is one of the weirdest, like if you thought Blake's kind of roundabout answers were odd, this, I'm like, what? Like, that's not an answer to the question. (laughs) Talk to me, what was that like having him be director, but also scene partner? I mean, what an intense job, like like to have to do so many things. I just found myself being like, wow, this, I really just want to have one job at once. Like I, and, and in fact, I've often felt that way. Like I really like writing and I like it so much. And it's special to be able to be a writer, but like, yeah, I was looking around just being like, I'm good with just acting. I, I really, I, I love it. I just want to do it. I feel like How I just had a stroke. Stroke. Right? <laughs> it's like, happened? girl, what? That's, what do you, what? I don't know. I just feel like it's so odd to see them do all these gymnastics to not answer the question instead of doing like a typical PR move where it's like you answer the question by kind of like just yeah, not I don't even know what drawing was that. too much attention to it. And then you have Justin Baldoni who was asked if he would ever... Like if he would direct the second one, because there's a sequel, That's prequel, a one, I don't yeah. know. And um, uh, so, he's, yeah, he was a lot more direct with his answer, you could say. This is probably the most like kind of shady answer. And even still, it's it's not shady, but it's like him basically saying, mm, no, I'm not. Absolutely. I'm not going to do the next one. And that's interesting because he also owns the rights to it already. Oh, does he? That's crazy. So he would have to sell them or do something. Meanwhile, while they won't talk about him or even say his name, this is him talking about Blake Lively. Blake Lively, who is a, a force in this movie, uh, biased as the filmmaker. I just believe it's it, it's a career-defining performance. Um, I don't think she's ever been better. Um, she brings so much depth and personality and um, and humor to Lily. And I just think audiences are going to fall in love with her. So um, if something happened and he's just covering, he's, he's doing a lot. He's literally like gives her a variety of compliments that it's not even just the same thing regurgitated. Like it's a new compliment each time. Yeah. So we do have it starts with us. So I'm hoping to see you back in the double duty role. I think the, uh, there are better people for that one. I think there are better people for that one. Justin. I think Blake Lively's ready to direct. That's what I think. Ooh. So, yeah. Justin said he doesn't know if he'd be game to direct the next one, but perhaps Blake would. Is that something that you would entertain? Oh, absolutely. I think that whoever decides to take charge of the next one would, would do it justice. But, you know, 
it's a lot of people to get the same schedules together again, so we'll see. Oh, absolutely. That's weird. <laughs> so, first of all, no expectation from Colleen Hoover that that's happening with Blake and him being in the same room again, it seems like. What's amazing is, like, he didn't even say, like, Blake would be good at it. He's just like, oh, she's ready to do it. Believe me, <laughs> she is ready. It, it gives the vibes of, well, she already did this one, yeah, so might as well just let her do it officially because sure. she stole this from me. And again, we've already said that she has been very vocal about all the other stuff she has done for this movie. Literally, I have, like, I'm looking at, like, 15 links to different interviews where she's, like, not just, oh, yeah, we all kind of... No, it's like, and then I did this, and then I did this, and it's like, okay, one woman show, we get it. Like, it's weird to see someone take so much of the credit and not acknowledge anyone else because usually it's all about, like, we had a great cast, we had a great crew, and it's really, like, talking about everyone involved, and she's like, well, then I had to do this, and then I stepped in and did this, and it's like, oh, God. I know. I was just thinking right now, too, didn't Colleen Hoover private all her stuff before the movie premiered? That was, like, a big oh, thing, wasn't it? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, like, Colleen I do Hoover know, went though, private on TikTok or everything, like, before the movie came out. Oh, well, because another thing about Colleen Hoover that people have given her a lot of shit for it is she's definitely not one to not want to make a quick buck. She's not really like, oh, I need this story of mine to really... Like even Be though this, I right guess this book, and all when it, I guess this book specifically is based like loosely on her mother, oh. so you would think that it would be very important to her. And I'm not saying it's not, but she has released like nail polish that's like inspired by the movie, and then specifically, I guess she tried to put out a coloring book. Oh, fun. And people were, like, not having it. And then she uh, issued an apology about it. I would understand why she would be down for Blake to direct, because that would be a great PR move to get a lot of attention on it and have it be a, another box office hit. Maybe not anymore if this road continues, but yeah. at the time of that, because that's what's crazy is all, so much of the stuff we're seeing now was filmed over the course of a few days that the backlash hadn't started yet. So Blake, for example, was giving the same kind of answers each time she was being asked because no one had said, like, what are you doing? But then finally, I think when it caught up was when she, one, had put out that Instagram post, but then also um, I saw a ton of comments on this one. She did the Copenhagen premiere, and that was three days after the original one in New York. This is one of her answers, and it's... Um, like about what she hopes young m women will take away from the movie. And it's so similar to one of Justin's answers that people in the comments are like, oh, so she just memorized now what he said because people are giving her shit. And I'm glad that she did shift her answer, but. I ask you, there are so many young women who read It Ends With Us and there are so many young women here tonight. So what do you hope that these young women take away from this movie? I hope they feel seen. I oh, hope no. they feel loved. <laughs> I hope they feel empathized with. And um, even I hope the they tone feel of like her voice always, change. Uh, there's always hope. There's always an opportunity, whether that's from yourself, from a best girlfriend. There, um, that you're not defined by anything any man has ever done to you. Yeah, I was about to say, now she's tying it back your in. Your identity is you, and mm -hmm. you define that. Mm -hmm. um, and you may, even if you don't have the emotional fortitude to be able to see it at the moment, or, or do what you need to do, that, like, your identity is only defined by you, and never a man, or never anything that happens to you, and, and that, that there's joy, and optimism, and love in the world, and, and you can have all of those things at, at once, because that's what it is to be human. You know what her speech is? <laughs> Literally, she starts, and then she just veers the yeah, it just went downhill. She couldn't fake it for too long. Her answer is giving that uh, speech in Mean Girls. We can all eat, be happy, you know, <laughs> rainbows. And I wish that I could bake a cake made out of rainbows and smiles and we'd all eat, be happy. She doesn't even go here. Do you even go to this school? No, I just have a lot of feelings. No, but literally the comments are, wow, the change is crazy. Another, has she been watching our TikToks about her? Oh my god, someone uh, pushed me she copying loves my listing friend's homework. Things. Literally, Took she notes just from his listing things. Saying what? Throwing them out Literally. there, seeing what happens. Everyone tends to want to talk about um, why this is such an important film and why it's so empowering. And, and I think that that is really important. But I think what's beautiful about this film is there is every color of human emotion in it. There's levity, there's joy, there's humor, there's hope, there's pain, there's tragedy, there's violence, there's trauma, there's um, sadness, there's um, uh, exaltation, there's, there's, you know, life, there's death, there is like love, there's loss, there's just 
I mean, really, like, it is, it is a kaleidoscope of the human experience. But yes, so it seemed like there was definitely a shift. There was never a shift in Justin's because he started from the beginning talking like that, so. He has also spoken about like how there were challenges filming, but he always does it in a way that's very not coming for anyone. Right. And very much like, I was the man, I shouldn't have been leading certain things anyway. Oh my God, this was one quote, he goes, you can't summarize Blake's contribution in a sentence because her energy and imprint is all over the movie. <laughs> And I'm like, she told us. <laughs> then he says, she made the film better from beginning to end. Ryan Reynolds was so generous. He's a creative genius, that guy. I heard that Ryan Reynolds wrote a scene for the film. Is that true? Look, I think that I, I'm pretty sure that everybody at some point wrote something for the film. Um, and yeah, Ryan, Blake, I'm, I was just so grateful that there's so many collective heads going in to try to make something uh, so beautiful. Do you remember and which scene? He wrote on a few scenes, I believe, and suggested a lot of things that made the movie better. I mean, the guy's a, the guy's a creative genius, um, and they work so well together. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, look, everything, everything she touches, she made better. So he's being very complimentary, very nice, yeah. and I think whether that's fake or whether he just like knows that he is not going to win in that battle, that he's just kind of accepted it. But um, they ask, would he work with the duo again when I'm... It's weird to me that it's a duo when it's like, why is he involved in this movie? And was he supposed to be? Or, or did, did he get just paid? Go like, or like he was just there? Pro I don't know. <laughs> I, like that's what's unclear. He's not credited from anything I've seen. Oh, and that was another thing. He wrote a scene in it. Ryan's here tonight. What is it like for the both of you to be promoting major motion pic pictures at the same time? Oh my gosh, it's just so thrilling in our house right now. I'm just, we're so, we, you know, we help each other. We work together so much. So the, the iconic rooftop scene in this movie, my husband actually wrote it. Nobody knows that, but you know. Um, but he wrote it. He, he works on everything I do. I work on everything he does. So his wins, his celebrations are mine and, and mine are his. I mean, he's all over this film. And that starts in pre-production and production and post. And we really show up for each other and we're surrounded by people in our life who show up for us yeah. and show up for each other so it's just like that's been the beauty of this is seeing i just seeing like just seeing deadpool and wolverine who's like you know is is goliath yeah showing up for us i mean they did this video with my co-star brandon recently i don't know if you saw that the no. they interviewed brandon who plays atlas um but you, you have to see just just look it up it's amazing it's on my instagram my husband um crashed the junket and uh and interviewed my love interest which went really well that Ooh. was that was lovely <laughs> actually your husband ryan reynolds wrote part of that rooftop yeah, scene no, is he that did. true yeah he that, yeah that's i mean I would have to compare it to the original one, but that's ninety something, ninety nine percent his his. Yeah, he 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 um he just added. Um, I mean, Chrissy Hall wrote an incredible screenplay. It was you know one of the reasons that I wanted to do this film. But also, you know, there are, are, are natural tweaks and modifications that come in when the actor is hired, and you're trying to infuse your own personality and your own authenticity. And I heard that Ryan Reynolds wrote a scene for the film. Is that true? Look, I think that I, I'm pretty sure that everybody at some point wrote something for the film. Um, and yeah, Ryan, Blake, I'm, I was just so grateful that there's so many collective heads going in to try to make something uh, so beautiful. Do you remember and which scene? I, he wrote on a few scenes, I believe, and suggested a lot of things that made the movie better. I mean, the guy's a, the guy's a creative genius. Yeah, that's crazy. And she like throws that into an interview. She's like, no one knows that, but I guess you do now. I'm like, what? Why was Ryan Reynolds right? Huh? Like, it's just weird. I'm all for a couple supporting each other. And like, especially if they can help the, I wouldn't even say the market. It's like, if you can support the movie and uh, hope that people go see it because he's bringing attention to it too. But I think it's weird that he did like hijack the marketing for at least that one uh, really awkward one that we watched earlier. And like, that Hugh Jackman's in it. There's other like interviews where Blake is like FaceTiming him or like, it feels weird. Yeah, for sure. I don't know. Um, my take on it is that I don't know what happened. No one does, but like feud aside, it seemed tacky at best how Blake handled a lot of the promo for it. And it seemed like she definitely took the lead. It wasn't like she was being told to say stuff. Like those were her choices. Oh, one important thing that I think actually was like potentially one of the kickoffs to the feud in general 
is we already said she hired another editor but apparently in mid-june before like the movie came out august 9th so mid-june she goes with colleen hoover to colleen hoover's book bonanza <laughs> and i guess it's some like convention thing she has in dallas and they do a q a and lively then surprises everyone in the audience and it's like two thousand people that they get to go see a screening of the movie the following night. They all like take a bus, they rent it out at movie theater. But it says and a it's a rough cut of the push. movie. So it's not even the finished product. It's a rough cut, and guess which rough cut it was? It was the one that the guy edited, the uh, Deadpool one? Yep. Oh, come on. You can't do that. That's insane. And the article that I pulled this from said literally it was like the screening proved to be a stroke of marketing genius for Sony, which bought the rights to release the movie from Wayfair Studios. And like Justin wasn't even there. And wow. I yeah, don't that know. must have felt like the rug was pulled from under him for sure yeah where it's like cool what do you mean you showed that cut and sony was like yeah and they loved it that's what we're going with it just seems like she's overstepping i don't like Big even time. if you're a producer that doesn't mean that you're like the director yeah and i think that how much she thinks she was in that, charge of you know everything. it really all this drama and her doing weird shit has overshadowed the element of db and that conversation and no matter what she says like i hope you feel seen like we can't see past your fucking bullshit right now because all we see on tiktok is not about the movie or about the story it's or about Britney Spears. DB. otherwise i think that pretty much covers it it's like there's stuff like as just like the editing was the problem and then other people are saying the marketing was the problem but then taking justin out of it completely people are saying blake is the problem just with how she was talking about it so there's a lot of different aspects and i spent days going through <laughs> all of these fucking interviews and stuff so i think i've covered pretty much all of it but if not maybe i will put an update here because oh I my god i can't imagine too much more will happen hopefully not well, the updates just keep coming. Brandon Sklenar, who is the other, who is one of the co-stars of the movie, has posted uh, the following on Instagram. It reads, Hey everyone, I wanted to take a minute and address all of the stuff swirling online. Colleen and the women of this cast stand for hope, perseverance, and for women choosing a better life for themselves. Vilifying the women who put so much of their heart and soul into making this film because they believe so strongly in its message seems counterproductive and detracts from what this film is about. It is, in fact, the opposite of the point. What may or may not have happened behind the scenes does not and hopefully should not detract from what our intentions were in making this film. It's disheartening to see the amount of negativity being projected online. Someone very close to me has been struggling with a relationship that is merely Lily's closely. I feel a responsibility to bring this to life and help spread that message further. It was only then that she read it. She credits Colleen's book and subsequently this film was saving her life. Trust me when I tell you there isn't a single person involved in the making of this film that was not aware of the responsibility we had in making this. A responsibility to all women who have experienced generational trauma, domestic abuse, or struggle with looking in the mirror and loving who they see. This movie is a harsh reality check for the men who need to get their shit together and take responsibility for themselves and their actions. This film is meant to inspire. It's meant to validate and recognize. It's meant to instill hope. It's meant to build courage and help people feel less alone. Ultimately, it's meant to spread love and awareness. It is not meant to once again make the women the bad guy. Let's move beyond that together. All I ask is before you spread hate on the internet, ask yourself who it's helping. Ask yourself if your opinions are based in any fact or if you simply want to be a part of something. Let's be a part of something better together. A part of a new story being written by women and all people everywhere. Lead with love and please be kind. Brandon. And it appears that there is no caption on this and the comments are turned off. Also interesting is that the tags in this post are Colleen Hoover, Blake Lively, Jenny Slate, Isabella Ferrer, and it ends with us movie. Not sure this is going to do what he thinks it will, um, not only because it's just kind of creating even more speculation for what happened, he also frames it as vilifying the women Everyone's making the women the bad guy when, I, I mean, let's be real, it's woman, singular. People are mad at Blake. And I think some of the backlash is justified because she has made some interesting choices. But I also think a lot of it isn't just Blake. It's something more driven by like Sony. And I think there's a lot of behind the scenes stuff that we just aren't ever going to know probably. And it kind of just created a perfect storm when you mix in the product promotion, the already tone deaf marketing that then seems to have partnered with her brands to do more tone deaf marketing. Then people are finding old interviews. So then they're trying to find reasons to justify not liking her more. And then when you couple it with the fact that Justin is so eloquent when he talks about it but then that like none of them will even say his name it feels weird because justin isn't giving anyone any ammo to hate on so all we're seeing is this man talk about how much this project means to him 
And then from the opposite end, we're seeing grab your florals, grab your friends, Betty Blooms. Oh my God, let's arrange florals. And like, then you see all of the interviews where they're playing games and everything's super lighthearted. It definitely all worked together to create this narrative that Blake is the villain. And I don't think that's necessarily true. We still don't know what happened between them, but... I mean, it's become increasingly clear that something definitely happened. But um, the Daily Mail put out an article on August 18th, which I think honestly feels like the most realistic of everything I've seen so far. The title is Blake Lively is effortlessly rude and wore down her woke feminist. It ends with us director Justin Baldoni and insider claims in revealing detail. And in the article, it says that an insider as usual, is exclusively sharing what they saw of Lively on set during filming, claiming that everyone was a little bit afraid of Blake. Baldoni, meanwhile, was derided as a woke and performative feminist. Lively wasn't mean. She was just so effortlessly rude. (laughs) There wasn't outward feuding or fighting, but the 36-year-old actress was so extraordinarily opinionated and had really strong feelings about things that it caused great stress and tension on set. There was tension on set whenever Lively was around, claims the source, because she wasn't shy about having workers wait on her. There was a palpable sense that everyone was a little bit afraid of Blake. I got this impression from Justin that he was just really, really stressed and fatigued about his constant inability to control the project he was making. So much so that when you'd ask him questions, he'd be like, well, just ask Blake. Because when Blake got there, she would have a lot of really strong thoughts and feelings. (laughs) So another factor in this is that apparently the production was interrupted because of the writer's strike. And it says, On the first day back from shooting, after production had been waylaid by nine months of writer strike, workers on set were desperate, dipping into their 401ks, losing their houses, etc. The insider felt it was tone deaf for Lively to bring her kids on set that day so they could set up a booth to raise money for sick kids and horses amid the crew's own struggles. There's nothing bad about having your kids be part of your workplace or having your kids be interested in activism, but it's hard to not have it feel insulting and performative. The source says she's clearly an advocate for the pretty blonde people in the world. And then it talks about her promoting her brands and it says, this is a trauma and this was an opportunity to provide resources for an underrepresented class who doesn't have a voice and instead she's selling shampoo. Meanwhile, it also says that on the other side of the rumored beef, the source claims that Baldoni was just as difficult to deal with on set. Justin is very similar to her, lively, in that he needs to be the smartest person in the room. He reportedly had a sty on his eyelid for most of the shoot and forced camera crews to re-block filming to avoid it. I wouldn't be surprised if the majority of the visual effects budget was dedicated to editing it out. The insider called Baldoni an idiot and a performative feminist. Both her and Justin are extraordinarily similar insofar that they are very special little snowflakes with a shocking amount of privilege and a shocking little amount of self-awareness. From what I watch, the film feels like two rich entitled people that have no experience with abuse and cosplaying what they imagine abuse could be like for hot people. Well, that's a lot. Um, There's also an article that um, basically just talks more about the creative struggle and how Justin was made to feel like his vision wasn't as important as Blake's and it stifled the creativity on set. He's also said to have taken it personally that Lively made various script and wardrobe changes, often without consulting him. A second person close to the situation, however, insisted that any changes or input by Blake was to create the best film possible and honor the book. Blake was a producer and worked closely with Colleen and other female team members on set. Without Justin's input does not mean she went behind his back. Mm, I don't know about that. So I, I, who knows what happened? Also, what does a PR crisis manager do? Because like he hasn't said anything. So are they, are they perhaps responsible for pushing out a bunch of this Blake Lively stuff? I'm not saying that happened, but I'm asking because he hasn't said anything. So like you have to wonder what did he hire them to do? Just a question. Anyway, I think that's it for updates, but I'm sure there will probably be more as soon as we post this. So that's all. Bye. Well, I guess we shall see. Thank you, Lily, for gathering all this information. Hopefully you guys feel a little bit more in the know about this. And uh, are you going to go watch it? I'm not. I don't think. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I haven't seen a movie in so long and I don't know if this is going to be the one that I dedicate the hours to. It's also over two hours long. Oh, hell no. I can't do that. It's like, that's the kind of length in a movie theater that I'm like checking my phone halfway through being like, how much is the runtime? Yeah, I Two hours I is can't. a long time. Yeah, no, I can't do it. <gasps> oh my God. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> 
Sorry, I'm looking through my mentions on TikTok and sometimes I can miss things. And as I'm scrolling, I see Ariel de Jesus, the tattoo artist. Mentioned you? And she literally, oh my God, I'm, I'm kind of in shock right now. She comments on her last post. Why do you tag at Jesse Smiles? I love her YouTube and been watching her way before her wedding and pregnancy. I love her. Why you tag her? <sighs> Queen, I'm sorry. Girl, I'm, I'm going to hold your hand when I tell I'm you sorry, this. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry i've been talking shit i'm sorry oh my god oh i'm my so god. stressed oh i'm sweating even more than i was before i hate this why do we do this job i hate it the real truth is i love talking shit you know i do it's fun it's a good time the unfortunate part is that i don't have the character to talk shit you know what i mean like i don't i'm not strong enough i can't deal well, with the consequences like of my to, actions we, what the fuck that, well we like to we like to shoot the shit we like to gossip but like we don't want to hurt people like no, i don't no, want to hurt someone's we feelings don't. or stuff and it's like that doesn't really work out with this job i know i do have a good time doing it i just oh man i like, do that feel just like we're usually heart. pretty fair but we, we she's kept be, up with my fucking we, wedding and pregnancy and i was talking about her we were dude the way that I was okay, tackling also that, that episode, looking at her tattoos, I feel so bad. Also, that y you haven't been pregnant for a very long time, so like, sounds like she's a not. She's fan. well, duh. If she doesn't know that I have a podcast, she obviously doesn't keep up with us. Surprisingly, a lot of people don't. People will be like, "I miss your miss you," and people will be like, "You know, she's on a podcast twice a week." Yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> Lily, man. where did you go? I Still feel here. bad though because I never really even thought of it that way. It's like, what if one of the topics of our episode is someone that used to watch us or like, you know? It's damn. Okay. Which, well, it, that's just hard to grapple with because we both are like, well, no one watches us. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Well, I don't have a We Love the Internet. I was scrolling for a while, couldn't find one. So that'll be mine, that little interaction. Th that's we really like, Things the internet. like that happen. It makes me sweat. <laughs> oh, my God. Okay. Well, I have one. It involves dogs, obviously. This month is my birthday, and my husband decided to surprise me with pickles, who I've introduced you all to. Here's the thing. <laughs> After pickles arrived to our family, um, funny thing. <laughs> How did that happen? <laughs> My husband. This is Peanut. No, we did not name him that. Pickles. Peanut. Peanut um, comes from a rescue. His previous owner um, took him in for a surgery and did not come back for him. He's two years old. <laughs> We're fostering him. Fostering. They're such intense, <laughs> hyper, difficult animals. It's a commitment. It's a commitment. Are we keeping him? I have been told by my sister that um, if I don't keep him, all hell will rain loose on me and the family will revolt. So, this is Peanut and Pickles. How cute are they? Yeah, she definitely has two dogs now, girl. Sorry to, sorry to break yeah, it to absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> I died at uh, Pickles just resting his head on top of me. Yeah. I love um, Dash Dashins. I can't say it right. Dachshunds. Da Dachshunds. <laughs> yeah, that's dogs. always a hard one to say. <sighs> well, Jasmine has made an appearance in this episode like the entire last half. She was just sitting on my lap on the other side. I don't think you saw Oh my her. God, how rare. Yeah. Well, I, she's normally not in my room because she doesn't get off this fucking chair. So I have to kick her out. But she was laying oh, on the bed I the entire time. I didn't realize that you sit in Jasmine's chair. You know, I knew she was going to love it from the second i got it and she has like a little like dark spot with all her fur that i sit my booty i was on. just gonna say max <laughs> Ow, dare she I just would have bit to... me this bitch <laughs> she's like yeah bitch it is my chair Look at her. <laughs> she, literally she accepts pets for so long and when she's done that's how she lets me know she's like <laughs> And then we're done. Yep. That's cat, okay, you cats can go very now. much hit their limit. And they're like, nope, I'm done. Anyway, you oh can my leave gosh. Now. If you guys made it to the end, we appreciate you. I am sweating profusely and I must go. But um, hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Thank you, Lily, again for your deep dive. And um, yeah, as always, hope you have a wonderful week and we'll see you on Friday. Bye. Yes. Bye.